Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining us for day two of our post-vax long COVID Congress. International speakers, yesterday was an incredible day looking at some of the science around what could be happening across the world with regards to COVID infection and any source of the spike protein. Today, it's not just about the science and the concerns we are bringing again, scientists, clinicians from across the world who have got real life experience working with patients. And they are trying to find the best way of finding solutions for everyone. So with great pleasure, I'll give you a quick introduction to everyone. Their presentations will be 15 minutes with a question and answer afterwards. There are seven speakers in total. So this is going to be a long period, but you're going to get tremendous information. These are all live on multiple social media platforms, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Rumble, and LinkedIn. And additionally, it can be found as well on my Substack afterwards if you want to hear the full conference in detail. So everything will be available. So let's just introduce you to all of um, our presenters. We've got them all here. I'll just ask them to say a quick hello to uh, everyone. Um, who am I missing? Wonderful. Hi, everyone. So... Everyone is just saying a quick hello to you. They're from all over the world. And myself and Joachim will be leading the presentation and asking some of the questions. Joachim will start with a short presentation himself. And then we'll go straight into Stephanie, then Tina, and then Beate. And then we'll continue from there. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here, and we look forward to sharing this wonderful information with everyone. So I'm going to take you all off now and just temporarily leave Joachim uh, with me here and allow Joachim to say a, a few quick words with regards to what it is that you want to, to share with us. I'm just trying to get your presentation ready. Yes, uh, welcome everybody to the fifth long COVID and post-vax conference. Uh, the second day, and um, maybe some uh, to introduce myself. I'm, my name is Joachim Gerwig, and I'm head of research and development at Medicinals Biotech India. And we started the project and our work in early 2020, collaborating with many of the experts you saw yesterday and that also present today at this conference. Our device group, diverse group, has expanded into more than 40 collaborative networks with many hundreds of experts working in medical sciences. Uh, university levels, integrative medicine, into including naturopaths, cardiologists, biologists, and many industry domains. And so we, uh, our role, uh, especially my role, is the um, development for dietary supplements and nutraceutical protocols. And if we go to to the first slide there, if you please can, Philip, can you share that? So, next slide, please. So they, I, this is on a side note, just very quickly, because we're going to touch a lot on dietary supplements and nutraceutical protocols. So what we have not only developed is the, the composition of the, of, the, of the protocols, but also make sure that they really arrive. So the, the bioavailability and the real measurable in vivo um, effect on biomarkers and organ damage is really important. So don't take a knife to a gunfight. Uh, please look also that if you take some protocols that they are really doing what they are supposed to do. So that wasn't a side note. Let's now get into what we are dealing with. On the next slide, please. Uh, we see that right from the pandemic, we all were aware of the unnatural origin of SARS-CoV-2 and the data of strange sequences and inserts was very helpful during the development of these protocols. So the title of this today's conference, The Silent Disaster, was chosen because we can observe an unprecedented health crisis manifesting and showing in solid metadata and is being reported by many of the therapists and doctors that we have here today and maybe they can give you a deeper insight and on what they are finding uh, an example of what can can be found most prominently actually is on the next slide you see the uh, multi-systemic disease developing especially in the cardiovascular and myocardial sector yeah, thrombosis microclotting endotheliitis myocarditis heart attacks strokes lung embolism and similar conditions are the daily work of many of the practitioners and therapists present here today. And you see on that example how that works out in most of the cases that uh, have either myocarditis or 
uh, myocardial infarction. On the next slide, you see what we are doing right now at the moment. We are working on spike detox protocols, and we are also the first ones now to really show that uh, in proof of concept in animal trials. Dr. Robin Rose will later get into more details on that. So that is really an interesting project at the moment. As to show you why it's important, on the next slide, you see that even there is now reports of brain scans that people with mild uh, COVID-19 infection or conditions would show, as you see on the next slide, would already see impaired blood flow in their brain that's measurable, even after mild COVID infection. So we're dealing here with a very unnatural virus because I don't know many viruses that can do these kind of things that you can see that even after asymptomatic or mild infection, just as a caution that we're not only talking about uh, vaccine injuries, we're also looking at what the virus can do to the organism. And another slide, and on the next slide you see then, I was uh, doing that because yesterday we had very, uh, let's say, concerning um, presentations on what has been done to that virus and what could be found. And so uh, we, we started right in, in the beginning to counteract what we what we could see in the in the spike protein. So that's why I call this uh, maybe a little bit with some sense of humor, gain of function protocol, where you see what is really needed. And not many people are aware of that. So you need fewer inhibitors, uh, inhibitors for GP120, uh, CCR5 um, fusion, and plus all the neurodegenerative markers that are showing already. So you want to be targeted right on that and really take care that you can tackle this problem as good as possible. On the next slide, you see another big sector that we are facing today is the immunodeficiency. You see widespread opportunistic infections, reactivation of retroviruses, bacterial fungal infections, widespread damage to the biome by SARS-CoV-2. So we have today several experts like Carlo Gronia who has discovered this incredible fact uh, that the bacteria is getting infected by the virus. Plus we have Rachel and Robin and other uh, um, experts here today to see how can we tackle the, the, the problems that arise after in the post-viral phase with a very se severe um, dysbiosis and other um, conditions. And the next sector that we are looking at is, of course, cancer. Now the, the, the cancer cases have risen, the newly re recorded cancer cases have risen by more than 10% in the US and other countries. On the next slide, you see an example of what is now in the daily life visible or for, for practitioners when they, when they see their patients. This is a case where a booster shot um, was causing a very quick um, uh, metastasis in the whole body within weeks. If you look at the next slide, you see the 8th and 30th of December, uh, September comparison. And this is a very, um, let's say, unsettling finding because that is usually not being observed. So how, how this can come about, we will see later in the, in the presentations. And as, if you look at the next slide, you see that we are working silently in the background. These are uh, cancer trials we are doing uh, in the university in Australia. And uh, so you see that we don't talk much about it, but we do whatever we can to, to prevent the, the uh, let's say, the, the, the onset of, of this, uh, this kind of conditions. On the next slide, you see another list of uh, what, what else we can observe and what is statistically already showing is widespread epigenetic dysregulations, autoimmune disease, metabolic disorders, widespread organ damages, systemic inflammation, systemic amyloidosis, and dysbiosis and intestinal inflammation. And so if you, if you look at the next slide, you see that even in the background, we're already working now to collect data on our protocols to see what kind of epigenetic um, rebalancing is possible with the protocols, because that is re really a big sector. If you have a complete, uh, um, let's say, offset epigenetic expression in most of your genes, that can also not be good for your health. Uh, it, will, it will lead to chronic disease. So Beate Jäger was also telling me that she finds this a very important factor. So that is from my side very quickly, just to see more or less in which directions we're going to go today with the topics. And uh, I want to uh, open the floor for our first speaker, my dear friend, Dr. Stephanie Senev. Welcome so much and thank you for coming. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joachim. Uh, just making sure that uh, Beate has got her um, microphone on. Can you just make sure that you're switched on, Beate? I think we first have Stephanie. 
Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, my my mistake. I, I we've got Stephanie here. Um, I'll just get Stephanie up. Sorry, Beate, not yet ready for you. <laughs> so yes, Stephanie, um, I will get your slides ready for you, and then we'll be ready to start uh, immediately uh, with regards to your presentation. So again, thank you very much, uh, Joachim, and we look forward to hearing more from our speakers. So you can go ahead now, uh, Stephanie, and we'll get your presentation here. Okay, great. Thank you <clears throat> very much. So this is the title of my presentation, Explaining Long COVID and Post-Vaccine Syndrome, Exosomes, the Thymus, and Immunosenescence. And I'm not going to be talk about, talking about solutions, but I'm hoping the rest of the team today will elucidate how to fix some of these problems that we're seeing. So you can go ahead and get the next slide. <clears throat> Outline so very brief outline, very brief introduction, and then I'm going to talk about exosomes. I'm going to talk about the thymus, and then a brief summary. So, why the mRNA vaccines are more likely to cause damage? I think this is really an important consideration here. The vaccines are very different from the virus, and so one thing, of course, is that the infection begins in the lungs, whereas the, the injection goes past all the barriers, both the vascular barrier and the mucosal barrier, straight into the muscle. Uh, the vaccine has a special, these designed message RNA that resists breakdown. And so it lasts a long time and it keeps producing spike protein as it lasts. And it's in these um, particles that it can easily be taken up by all the cells. These are like nanoparticles looking like LDO particles. The immune cells even take up the, the uh, vaccine RNA and start making spike protein. The muscle cells are taking up an important thing is this part that's in red. I think they take up the nanoparticles and then they synthesize large amounts of spike protein. And then they release it, as well as the message RNA, into toxic into uh, exosomes that can also carry that will also carry the toxic cationic lipid that's in the in the vaccine. All of that's going to be dispersed throughout the body via exosomes released from the muscle cells. And then the spike protein itself, of course, is extremely neurotoxic. Uh, it gives an inflammatory response wherever it goes. It's amyloidogenic. We've heard all of that. Uh, neurodegenerative disease and heart damage can be expected. And much of the pathology may be related to antibodies to the spike protein and then molecular mimicry, especially because the spike protein disrupts the immune system. So now we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so here's uh, uh, some quotes from uh, uh, J. Patrick Whelan, who uh, commented on the spike protein, and he was suspecting that uh, the spike protein is the most dangerous part of the disease. Uh, and it, it has this fear and cleavage site. It releases the S1 unit, which is the one that can bind ACE2 receptors. It, it can go into the blood vessels and, and link to the endothelial cells. It becomes a neurotoxin in the brain. And so uh, the spike S1 unit is capable alone of being taken up through the ACE2 receptor in the endothelia and then causing microencephalitis. And that can be the basis for the neurologic complications of COVID-19. Next slide. So uh, next slide, <laughs> the exosomes, my first topic. So the big picture, exosomes released by transfected muscle cells and immune cells circulating throughout the body deliver the spike protein and the spike messenger RNA to distant cells. They can reach the brain directly from the deltoid muscle via nerve fibers. This is very important. I think this is significant because we're seeing so much inflammation in the nerves in the brain. I uh, received that evidence in the VARS database. I think there's a direct path um, along nerve fibers from the muscles to the brain, and then you get the brain inflammation <clears throat> and never have to cross the blood brain barrier already past the blood brain barrier when it's injected. So it enters neurons and then other cells, ACE2 receptors, induces senescence. This leads to neurological disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and vascular aging. Next slide. Um, so this is an important paper that I found some time ago, really interesting paper that was done by these, this team of two. Um, they basically did things in in vitro cultures and they, and they exposed cells grown in culture to the spike protein, to, to basically to the vaccine. And these, they showed that they released exosomes and those exosomes contain certain microRNAs that are listed here. And those microRNAs, then they, they expose those exosomes to um, immune cells from the brain, microglia. And they showed that those immune cells took up those exosomes and activated those microRNAs, which resulted in an inflammatory response. And so they say a bystander pathway of SARS-CoV-2 mediated central nervous system damage through hyperactivation of human microglia. Next slide. Um, so this is a, an important slide. This was from before, 2019, before COVID. Uh, but these people were studying exactly this, mRNA-based vaccines. They had a different uh, protein in there. 
you can see at the right they administered the uh, the shot and they showed experimentally that the that the lipid could be taken up by the cells that are picking up the vaccine and then they release the exosomes and and, and this is extracellular vesicles evs they go to another cell somewhere else that cell takes up the exosome and starts making protein. In other words, message RNA is hiding inside the exosome. And exosomes are actually very good at protecting RNA from breaking down. So it's a communication network that the cells use uh, to communicate among themselves, but they're gonna put toxins in there, such as the spike protein and its message RNA because it's being delivered by the vaccine and distributed it throughout the body. Next slide. Uh, so this is a, I looked for muscle cells to see what about muscle cells and exosomes, and I found it. This is a good paper here. You see this picture on the right showing muscle cells that are stressed. They release those little ones, they're exosomes, but they also have these apoptotic bodies and these microvesicular ectosomes. All these things are being released by these damaged cells. The muscle cells are going to be extremely damaged by this vaccine. And this, um, and so this paper says overall evidence is accumulating that the cargo of muscle-derived exosomes can be changed under pathological conditions, which just certainly is. And those exosomes contribute to the propagation of pathogenic responses to distant cells. So this is very important. So the next slide. Um, so this is my theory, exosomal transport to the brainstem nuclei. I found that in fact, at the uh, synapse, between the muscle and the axon from the spinal cord of the, of the motor neuron that's in the spinal cord, that axon uh, it, it actively transports endosomes along the axon and pumps them up to the, to the body of the cell. This is known. And it also takes up exosomes, even gets nutrition from exosomes in the synapse from the muscle. And so you have the exosomes being released by the muscle cells, taken up by the axon, transported to the spinal cord. And then a similar relay happens to go another step up to the brainstem nuclei and on beyond to the upper motor neuron. So all of this, I can picture this spike protein in those exosomes traveling all the way from the muscle. And if you have a very strong muscle, probably gonna have better pathway. I think that might be why people who are wrestlers and um, you know basketball players, people who have strong arm muscles are probably more susceptible to damage because of this. Uh, next slide. Uh, so SARS-CoV-2 causes senescence in human cells. Um, this was a, a paper that showed that S1 induces ACE2 stimulation, increases reactive oxygen species, and it can cause a, a, a senescent response by the cell, leading towards a senescent cell burden and resulting in morbidity and mortality. And so uh, this increased abundance of senescent cells in the brain could contribute to brain fog, physical inactivity, lethargy, muscle weakness, frailty, all these different uh, features that we're seeing of long COVID, and that could be uh, the cause. Uh, of the symptoms experienced in long COVID. Next slide. Um, and so this is just a, a, another paper. You can find all these papers about exosomes and senescence. And here you can see that here's a senescence related exosome in the middle. And these things are gonna influence all the different tissues. They're distributed throughout the body. They can cause cardiovascular disorders, neurological disorders, vascular aging, diabetes related disorders. All of these things uh, are from, exosomes released from senescent cells. And in our case, they're gonna be loaded up with spike protein and spike message RNA as well. Next slide. Next topic, thymus, the big picture. Activated dendritic cells, which are responding to the spike protein that coming to the muscle, they're gonna to return to the thymus. Some of them return to the thymus and they promote thymic involution, which is a marker of biological aging. And so there's an easy pathway from the axillary lymph node under the arm to the thymus via the lymphatic vessels. Thymic epithelial cells, they express the H2 receptor and they can be attacked by the spike protein getting damaged. And then damaged TECs, TECs, are unable to prevent self-reactive T cells from escaping the thymus into the periphery. That's a direct path to uh, autoimmune disease. And the damaged TECs are also gonna promote a loss of naive T cells that can respond to new exposures. So you're gonna have immune suppression as well as autoimmune disease, which is a characteristic feature of a lot of the uh, reactions to the vaccine. Uh, next, next slide. So here's a, a, an interesting paper that I found on the thymus talking about SARS-CoV-2 SARS infecting the thymus and it induced a loss of function, which correlated with disease severity. Very interesting paper. They had pa people who were healthy. You can see at the top here, top left, some people who were sick, but no, not ICU and then the ICU patients. They compared the three. And they found a general trend that the ones who were sicker had a, a, a weakened ability to produce T cells and B cells. So they have a weak immune system. They already sort of have a thymic involution problem. 
And then they hear that on the right here, they looked at the thymus of, of a person who died from COVID, very shriveled up, obviously uh, very much into involution stage, whereas a healthy donor has a much bigger, healthier looking thymus. And then they even were able to take thymus, TEC cells in isolation and infect them by exposing them to the RNA of the virus. And so they have a model at the bottom right, which shows a SARS-CoV-2 infecting the thymus and causing impaired function of the tech cells, which is gonna produce, uh, the impairment is gonna be uh, loss of cell adhesion, loss of tight junctions, reorganization of the extracellular matrix is gonna be um, a sick thymus. And that's gonna result in, in thymic involution, which is gonna be uh, a problem for the immune system. Next slide. Um, so this is also very much uh, in line with it because NLRP3 inflammasome will induce a process which is going to lead directly to thymic involution. And it's been shown that the ionizable cationic lipids in the vaccine can cause the lysosomes to rupture, which is a huge problem for the cell. That's gonna induce the response. This is a very dramatic uh, response crying out for help, NLRP3 inflammasome. This inflammasome causes accelerated thymic involution and that's a marker for biological aging. So it's a major cause of immunosenescence and inflammation. And we've got these four papers referenced here to explain this process. Next slide. So uh, here's thymic involution. This is showing how the mature DCs in this picture here on the left, you see this circulating mature DCs and then an arrow up into the thymus. Those are, it's really fascinating that some of those activated DCs, and these are gonna be activated DCs contaminated with the spike mRNA, travel to the thymus, continue to make spike protein, damage those thymic um, epithelial cells, and that's going to uh, really cause a lot of trouble to the thymus, uh, accelerating aging. In fact, it's very clear that the, the health of the thymus is directly proportional to the health of the immune system. And so um, these uh, techs are going to get destroyed, and then it has this you know, particular pathway, the JAK1 notch 3 signaling pathway, results in acute atrophy of the thymus. Next slide. Uh, so this process, this is a quote from the paper, this process might weaken the protective immune response against pathogens, thus increasing susceptibility to microorganisms such as SARS-CoV-2 and leading to a high incidence of autoimmune disorders in older individuals due to the impairment of negative selection. And that's very important because the thymus is going to control not releasing those immune cells that can attack the tissues. And that's going to become impaired because the thymus is damaged, and then the tissues are going to get uh, attacked by the immune cells that are responding to human proteins. Uh, next slide. Um, mice deficient in MTEX develop autoimmune liver disease. This is just showing that this will happen if the MTEX are destroyed. You're going to get autoimmune liver disease if you're a mouse. This was, of course, they do all these experiments with mice. These mice were engineered to have um, a depletion of the MTEX, which are really uh, critical uh, text in the thymus to control these uh, autoimmune disease. And so the thymus was unable to, and you can see here on the, on the left, the picture on the right-hand side is where there's no MTEX. And then you have auto, the red on the bottom, CD4 plus CD8 plus no tregs. These tregs on the left are going to help to stop the, 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 C, the T cells from attacking the tissues. Those tregs are missing because of the uh, destruction of the MTEX. No protection from autoimmune attack. And so they had an inability to remove self-reactive T cells and an inability to, to induce naive T cells, which would have uh, been able to adjust to some new exposure. So both immune suppression and autoimmune disease. Next slide. So the hallmarks of immunosenescence, uh, this, this is another um, paper that I found, a nice interesting diagram here showing um, on the left, you have this hallmarks of immunosenescence uh, going down to consequences on the left with um, increased infection, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disease, autoimmune disease, metabolic disease, tumorigenesis. All of these are gonna go up as a consequence of immune su suppression. On the right, you can see this SASP, which is this inflammatory, you know, cellular senescence, inflammatory response, inflammaging, thymus degeneration at the top. And then the T cell population is disturbed here on the third box um, with an inadequate number of naive T cells. Um, and then uh, too many uh, um, autoimmune attacking T cells that are gonna uh, attack the tissues. And then there are metabolic changes as well with increased glycolysis, um, mitochondrial um, imp impairment of mitochondrial biogenesis, all of these problems, and reactive oxygen. Next slide. Uh, thymic involution aging. So this is just another paper. There's a lot of papers out there on this topic. It's really, really fascinating. And I've, I've had a real deep dive into the immune system in my, in my experience. And so 
Um, they, they showed histopathological findings on the left, clinical features on the right. So the thymus becomes small, its cellularity gets messed up, fat tissue accumulates, um, loss of a normal architecture, uh, and then um, impairment in the naive T cell release and, um, and too many mature T cells that uh, can cause trouble by attacking the tissues. And then you have severity, increased severity of uh, susceptibility to infection, um, decreased responsiveness to vaccination, uh, increased incidence of cancers, incidence of autoimmune disease, all these go up. And this is exactly what I think we're seeing in response to these vaccines. Next slide. So in summary, the exosomes released by transfected muscle cells and immune cells may play a critical role in distributing the spike protein, spike message RNA, and ionizable cationic lipids to distant sites. Exosomal transport along nerve fibers to the brainstem nucleus is a direct path on the other side of the, of the blood-brain barrier. It never has to cross the barrier. The spike protein activates ACE2 receptors in the brain and causes senescence and neuro, neural injury. Activated dendritic cells migrate to the thymus where the spike protein ionizable cationic lipid can be expected to be toxic to the thymic epithelial cells. And the loss of those texts in the thymus is a direct pathway towards thymic involution, inflammation, immunosenescence, increased risk to infection, autoimmune disease, and cancer. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Perfectly timed, <laughs> uh, Stephanie. So um, I just want, if you don't mind, uh, George, I want to ask the first question on this one here. And Stephanie, what I want to ask is because you mentioned specifically to do with the exosomes and the mRNA, um, although it's the most common vaccine used across the world, do these patterns also occur with other variants of the uh, vaccine? So the adenovirus or even a protein-based um, vaccine. Do you think that this pattern is specific to mRNA? Well, exosomes, of course, are a general thing, but I think that the, these uh, vaccines are especially good at causing the cell to have to release exosomes because it's going to get the cell to be making all this spike protein, which it needs to get rid of because it's toxic. And it's, it's a mechanism that cells are very used to is to get rid of this spike protein that they're making and put it into the exosomes along with those cationic lipids, which are also toxic. Those cationic lipids actually show up in the exosomes one-to-one -one with the nucleotides in the, in the uh, RNA. Really fascinating, that paper that I, that I talked about in one slide. They pair up. And so it's, it's actually getting rid of the toxic um, cationic lipid as well, which was talked about yesterday. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Grace, I think it was Grace. Uh, uh, <laughs> what was her name? <laughs> Christy Grace. Christy Grace. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very yeah. nice talk she gave. Um, so I think it's worse with these, uh, especially the protein based wouldn't be as much, but um, possibly the DNA ones, um, DNA based would be like an, an infection with the virus. So they probably would also release exosomes. But I think the combination of the cationic lipids, which is different, and the, also the RNA that's uh, very sturdy, doesn't break down. Uh, that makes these vaccines the most toxic with respect to the exosome distribution. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, as usual, Stephanie, it's a fascinating and horrific way, as, as usual. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think some of the things we might be able to tackle, uh, I mean, the uh, immune senescence and the senescent cells being predominantly the ones uh, kicking out these uh, exosomes. And so you were talking with me together on another conference about Senolytics, so the usage of uh, senolytics to break them up might be a very uh, good idea. And uh, yeah, I wanted to ask maybe one more uh, other thing is like um, the the, um, the using them as a Trojan horse. So if we saturate the body with poly polyphenols and other compounds, because the the, the exosomes are, and the exocellular vesicles are not per se something bad. They are actually a normal transportation mechanism. They are so called so to see natural lipid nanoparticles that our cells excrete and if we saturate the cells with phenolic compounds then we can they are they have shown to as well get into the <laughs> extracellular vesicles so we might use them even as they are carrying a toxic load we might bring in a trojan horse uh, approach and, and have enough phenolic compounds like curcumin and others have proposed right. to do that so that oh, they can be dimmed a little bit but to reduce spike load and viral load in the first place would be the most important thing to, to suggest in this case. I think mm -hmm. I'm not. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the problem. 
Thank you so much. We can speak later at the round table. I have a ton, tons of more questions. <laughs> excellent, okay. excellent. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And we'll move straight ahead into our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Tina Pears. I'll just ask you to unmute your mic for us. And as we said, we'll talk in the round table afterwards. So um, getting the stage set for you, Tina, I'll just ask you to do a quick introduction of yourself, and then you can go into your presentation. Oh, thank you very much, Philip. Um, I'm Tina Pierce from the UK. Um, I see, uh, I've been seeing patients with mast cell activation syndrome since 2016. And, um, and then in 2020, I, like Shankara Chetty in South Africa, started to treat acute COVID patients in the same way. Um, he and I came to the same conclusions, um, even though we didn't know each other at that time. And then I opened a long COVID clinic in, twin, in November 2020. And, um, and now some patients with, um, with spicopathy and reaction to the injections are booking into my clinics and I'm seeing them as well. Excellent. Okay, I'll get you straight to your presentation, Tina. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. So I thought today I would actually present a case because I think that's really interesting for people to hear about. And this is a, a lady who has got some, some elements of MCAS and some long COVID and, exas and it's been exacerbated by the three vaccines that she had. Next slide, please. So um, mast cell activation is found in, uh, in many people, 17 to 20% of the population have a genetic predisposition to slightly abnormal dysfunctional mast cells. And they overreact to various um, stimuli causing a cytokine storm. Um, and, but often when they are tested uh, uh, with various blood tests, et cetera, they're normal. The tests are normal, but the patient is suffering with many different symptoms. Um, there is, has been a proven role of MCAS uh, in the hyperinflammation involved in the C19, severe infections, the long COVID and the spicopathy. So many papers have been written about this connection now. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the therapeutic interventions that we are interested in introducing are optimization of nutrition, improvement of their BMI, their blood sugar control. Um, a low histamine diet is important. And there's an excellent website called whatthebleepcaneat.com, uh, which helps people choose the low and no histamine foods. Um, it's all important for food to be organic, fresh, no processed food, freshly prepared. Um, you have to establish a healthy microbiome, obviously important for all of us, but especially in this group of patients. We find that the bifidobacterium and lactobacillus and other uh, short chain fatty acid producers are hit by, um, by COVID. Um, and as Carlo Bronya um, has, uh, will talk about, I think, um, that the, uh, the actual virus can um, kill off these bacteria in the, in the gut. Um, we also want to inhibit the uh, spike protein cleavage and prevent any further binding, if at all possible, in these patients. Elimination of the spike from the body, of course, is the panacea that we're all aiming for. And, um, and then healing of the damage that's been caused. So restoration of homeostasis, restoration of the immune system, restoring mitochondrial function, because the spike is particularly uh, toxic for the mitochondria. Um, and so uh, we see a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction that has to be sorted out and then treat any reactivated infections such as EBV, Lyme's disease, mycotoxins, CMV and parasites. And then also look out for treating any childhood trauma or neuroplast and um, ask the patients if they could do some neuroplastic retraining, because these have all got an important part to play in, in the calming down of their immune systems. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Philip. Thank you. So this is my lady. She's a lovely lady called Catherine and she's 55 years old and she'd been seen by various consultants for two years before she found her way to my clinic. Um, and I saw her on the 7th of February in 20, this year, 2023. Her last menstrual period is 48, so she was postmenopausal. She'd actually started HRT 
um, in the April 2022 before she'd seen me. But then she stopped it in July, just a few months later, when she saw a gastroenterologist who was investigating her for all her GI symptoms. And he suggested that she should come off it. She'd had migraines since the age of 50, which are all probably hormonal um, or because of the lack of hormones. And um, she had a C19 infection in both 2020 and in June 2022. And she'd had three inoculations for C19 um, over the over that time starting in 2021 and she'd been very very unwell after each injection and also um, since all three she'd been very unwell so unwell since early 2021 next slide please so what were her symptoms? Well, they were pretty miserable. Um, she had chest pains, which made her think she was having a heart attack. Um, she had pain in her neck, her ears and her throat, and these were fairly constant. She'd lost one stone in weight because she had very severe debilitating diarrhea. Uh, she couldn't go very far because she had to always be near a toilet. Um, she had other symptoms, including brain fog, muscle twitching. She had fasciculations and sent me a video, actually, of her thigh muscles fasciculating, um, which is a really disconcerting symptom. Uh, she had aches and pains, mucus in her throat, earache, um, runny nose, poor sleep, tingling, hematuria, just once, uh, numbness in the right side of her body predominantly, pain in her feet and her hands, especially again affecting the right side of her body, and hot sweats. So she felt absolutely wretched for two years. She was unable to function normally. She couldn't exercise. She couldn't look after her family. She couldn't go to work. Next slide, please. So in her past medical history, she had had frequent tonsillitis under the age of 12. Um, she, had been she had not been exposed to mold or Epstein-Barr virus or Lyme's, um, and she'd not had any childhood trauma. But she was very sensitive all her life to smells, and this is a very common finding in patients with MCAS, very sensitive um, senses. So smells, bright lights, and noises she didn't like. And she actually wore sunglasses during the day because she was so sensitive to, to the light. Um, she'd had IBS symptoms since her late teens with loose stools, bloating, and severe wind, probably caused by high histamine foods, but she hadn't made the connection. And then more recently, uh, um, she'd had upper gastric symptoms with wind and her stools had been pale and floating for the last 12 months. But uh, prior to coming to my clinic, she had tried a low histamine diet herself and she'd found that actually um, she the diarrhea had reduced and she had a better color of the stool. So she'd already started her road to recovery by doing that. Next slide, please. Her tests that she'd had were, um, she'd had a thorough neurological examination because at some point the neurologist she saw was worried she had motor neuron disease with the fasciculations, et cetera. Um, she had low ferritin, which has always historically been low, but otherwise all her tests were normal. Her CT scan was normal, gastroscopy was normal, colonoscopy, all normal. Next slide, please. The problem is when these patients see consultants and they find all the tests are normal, they're offered no treatment. So they come away just as unwell as when they first saw them. Um, her GP had given her some omeprazole for her acid reflux and fexofenadine, but she had not felt had helped. Next slide, please. So what did I do? Well, I said, what we have to do is try different things, adding them in one at a time so we can work out what's helping or what isn't helping and then um, and then add in the next thing. So I asked her to try Pyroton one at night because I wanted to help her sleep. And I think when you're sleep deprived, all of the other symptoms seem so much worse. So we had one Pyroton at night and then after a few days, um, I wanted her to add in Loratadine, 10 milligrams in the morning and one um, mid-afternoon. So she was, she was effectively taking an antihistamine eight hourly. Um, and I also then I uh, asked her a few days after that to then add in ketotophen um, syrup, which is a um, another type one antihistamine, but it's a weak antihistamine and it's a strong mast cell stabilizer. So you build up the dose with that gradually. I also gave her a short course of azithromycin, 250 milligrams, <clears throat> excuse me, um, one a day for six days, because we know that COVID enters the microbiome actually with bacteriophagic ability. So I wanted to make sure she wasn't carrying any of the virus still in her gut. 
we organized a microbiome gut analysis test and I asked her to buy an ARC microcurrent device. Now this is an amazing little device um, which works on the mitochondria. It boosts ATP production three to five fold. And as we know, there's mitochondrial dysfunction which causes the exhaustion and the fatigue. Um, it's important to address that. So I asked her to get one of those and to use programs one and two. Um, and to use it every day for as much as possible. Also to take Toxaprevent, which is a zeolite that reduces the histamine um, in the meal that you're just about to eat. So um, that's useful to take NAC, high dose of vitamin D, vitamin C, which is a natural antihistamine and excellent, and also good multivitamin mineral tablet. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Philip. Yes, thank you. Um, and then I saw her three months later and she said she had had an improvement in most of her symptoms. These, uh, her sleep had improved, her weight had increased because remember she'd lost a stone in weight. Um, her weight was now eight stone five up from seven twelve. Her migraine had stopped, interestingly. Her muscle twitching had improved by 90%. She had aches and pains in her arms and legs. They were much better, 90% better. Some improvement of her wind and acid reflux. Um, however, she was feeling so much better, she started exercising and she'd obviously done too much. Um, and she got some of the post-exercise uh, um, um, fatigue. And she'd also unfortunately had a meniscal tear of her knee. Next slide, please. So we'd also then got her results of her stool analysis, which showed that she was low in secretory IgA. All her other health, mar health markers were normal. Next slide, please. Um, and she was also low in the butyrate production. As we know, the COVID destroys the lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium in particular. So we had to then build those up again, um, giving her prebiotics, probiotics, and, uh, and asking her to, uh, to feed those bacteria and encourage their growth. Next slide, please. Um, also, for her persisting symptoms, uh, which were some hormonal symptoms, remember this lady wasn't back on her HRT, so she had hot flushes, etc. And um, she still had a constantly runny nose, intermittent rash on her abdomen, brain fog. Um, she was using the recommended uh, supplements for her gut and had found that the diarrhea had completely stopped doing that. Um, and she had reduced abdominal pain as long as she didn't have anything with high histamine in it to eat. Um, she found that the ARC microcurrent device was particularly useful and I encouraged her to use it as much as possible. Next slide, please, Philip. Um, I then she was th at that point she was on ketotifen, which she was taking eight mils at night, which is over one milligram. Um, she was taking loratadine twice a day, and I added in nizatidine 150 milligrams twice a day and stopped the omiprazole. Um, and um, and then also we. We then had augmented NAC available, which actually denatures 99.8% of the extra stralula spike protein. So I asked her to take that because we wanted to reduce the spike protein uh, load um, that she had in her body. With MCAS, it's important to eliminate all the different triggers, whether that's mold exposure or, um, or uh, histamine, high histamine foods or the spike protein. And in patients who've had COVID and also the vaccine, it's very often this, the spike protein is a trigger. So we have to clear that out as much as possible. And for all the reasons that you've been listening to for the, over this conference about how toxic it is. So we all need to try and get rid of it. I also introduced some HRT for her and asked her to start with half a squirt of estrogel and then to gradually build up and to take eutrogestan 100 milligrams every night. She was able to stop the pyroton at that stage because eutrogestan actually helps to encourage sleep. So you take that in the evening. Next slide, please. And then I reviewed her three months later. So this was the beginning of August and she was very much better by now. Um, she was now playing tennis, doing yoga, going, taking her dog for a walk, looking after her family, looking after her house. Um, so she was very, very much better. 90% of all her symptoms had resolved on the low histamine diet, the medication, the augmented NAC and the ARC device. Her weight was now eight pound, eight stone eight, Pounds. Um, so that was a huge improvement. So she was obviously absorbing her food um, 
better in a better way, which was great. So she was getting more vitamins and minerals and so on. Um, she was now having very few fasciculations, but she was still seeing some. She sent me a video of this actually, which she's happy for me to share with you. So I will give that to Philip, and perhaps you can put it on. Uh, with the conference, um, uh, you know, slides, etc., and she reported that the augmented NAC, the ketotifen, the nizatidine, and the ARC machine she felt were particularly helpful. Next slide, please. So, um, so this is what she's on now, and she was on half a squirt of estragel. So I've asked her to slightly increase that. Um, when we, ha when I see women who have got a long COVID um, spikeopathy and they are perimenopausal, if they are on HRT already, we leave them on the HRT. If they're not yet on it, I don't introduce it at the same time as all the other treatment modalities because um, if estrogen can actually increase your histamine. So I like to try and stabilize them as much as possible uh, with the uh, with the treatment of lowering the spike lowering the histamine, et cetera, type one, type two antihistamines, quercetin, et cetera, um, before then adding in the, um, the, uh, the, the HRT. Next slide, please. Um, I've also, um, she's also obviously taking the augmented NAC now. She started with one three times a day for three months and now she's on one a day. She's continuing to use the ARC. I introduced ivermectin 12 milligrams once daily with food at this point because this does inhibit the um, toll-like receptors um, and reduces inflammation. And I just really want to try and clear the other 10% of her symptoms that she feels are still there. And the other thing which I forgot to put on this list, this list, I'm afraid, is I've asked her to start low dose naltrexone, which also um, the dextro naltrexone reduces the toll like receptors uh, and therefore also the IL 6 um, and inflammatory cytokines. So, and the neck, and we're going to, uh, she's going to get some medicinals nine, um, and she's going to start using that as well because we want to clear out as much of this spike as possible. And the next slide, please. I think it's my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. And there are just some interesting um, uh, um, links for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. And um, we'll add Joshim in as well. well wonderful. Um, Joshim, I'll let you start with the first question this time. I, I do want to ask uh, Tina a question, but you go ahead first. Yes, thank you so much, Tina. And yeah, we have been... Uh... Uh, contact for quite a while. Look, I have one question, uh, two questions actually. So, uh, what do you observe with people that are already in long hauler conditions, be it by uh, infection or injection, when they get reinfected now with Omicron? Uh, we have reports that this can bring them uh, into a relapse. It, it can. It, can. It, it seems like there are two groups there. Some of them go into relapse um, and some of them uh, find that the infection is very much um, uh, less, less severe because they're already on the antihistamines and the Marcel stabilizer. And, um, and they say, oh, well, it was, it was much easier this time to get through the infection than it was last time. Um, but some, um, when they have settled and they're feeling very much better from their long COVID symptoms, have reduced some of their medications or come off them altogether. And then when they get COVID, uh, my advice is get back on them quickly. Um, uh, so, yeah, so it, I've seen both. Yes, uh, maybe that is interesting for you as you are an MCAS expert. Uh, the, I have a lot of uh, reference papers right now on how, how that works on, on the mast cells because they display the FCY gamma receptor and makes them susceptible to uh, direct spike fusion and or viral entry. And that mm -hmm. counts not only for mast cells, also monocytes and other uh, immune cells. So yeah. uh, we are looking at how to, how to stop the uh, in, in intrusion of the spike protein and the um, virus itself into the mast cells because that is one of the upstream, most upstream mechanisms you, you might want to look at if you want to look at mm. mast cell activation. I'll send you yeah. all the documentation. Thank you. My, my question is just a clinical one, Tina. Your expectation, even with this patient, 90% improvement, mm. um, she's still on antihistamines. Will she get back to normal or is this the equivalent of a long-term immune, dis mm. autoimmune disease where she'll need lifelong treatment? 
So in my experience, um, people can generally, once they get everything to calm down, uh, but this could take six months, a year, 18 months, um, they can then find that they don't need to take all of the medication every single day. And some of them will stay on something like the mast cell stabilizer, ketotifen. They'll continue with all the vitamins and minerals. They'll carry on with the diet uh, predominantly but they will allow themselves the occasional treat and go out to eat you know, in a restaurant or a friend's houses where they'll have a high histamine meal. Um, but they um, but they generally then maybe only take the type one and type two antihistamines when they have symptoms or a flare. So it's, it's learning how to manage the condition. Um, and um, so they can actually stabilize things and they can and the I think the neuroplastic retraining can really help with that actually so a lot of them express say that they've had maybe a 30 percent improvement when they have started to use their their conscious mind to try and calm down their immune system and their subconscious mind is is working uh, in their favor rather than against them so we have to take a multi-pronged approach and be flexible and actually, the marvelous thing is the patients learn about their condition. They start to really know what their triggers are, avoid their triggers as much as possible, um, and then know when to take the medication as and when they need to. That's That's been my experience. Excellent. And uh, thank you very much, Tina. Uh, we've got Carla here with us. And so we'll have further discussion with you at the round table, but we'll be getting straight into our next presentation, Carlo. And I will ask you first to just introduce yourself. Switch. Uh, can you switch on your microphone? And, um, and then we'll go straight into your presentation. Thank you again, Joachim. Okay. Go ahead, Carlo. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, my presentation, I am Carlo Brogna, um, a physician from Italy, south of Italy, and uh, I, I, is, I am also a researcher. Uh, we have a, a facility where, where, uh, um, where we uh, make many ex experiments on SARS-CoV-2. So uh, we have treated many patients in, during these uh, three years. Uh, with uh, with our protocol that derives from our fun, finding, uh, so uh, I will show you uh, in my presentation uh, a, a concern, a public health concern uh, that is uh, the result of our fun, finding. Thank you for uh, inviting me at, uh, in this uh, in this congress. Uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you, Jackie. Okay, let's, uh, we can start. My presentation is in T-Trap, Fate or Science. Everything you need to know from another point of view, from point of view of bacteria, of gut microbiome. Uh, a summary of this presentation is uh, visible also online uh, by Dr. B uh, on YouTube. Uh, uh, let's see next slide, please. Okay, uh, all of us know that in the last past three years, uh, we have a, a pandemic, okay, COVID-19. We have uh, learned many, many things about this pandemic. Uh, how is a lockdown or someone has, has lost uh, his or her jobs, uh, someone has lost her or his friends, and all of us have a horrible experience. Uh, um, these three years was very hard for every, everyone. And uh, we have many, uh, we have, uh, we have passed many restrictions. Uh, but uh, uh, during these three years, uh, we were uh, continually reassured by our uh, governments uh, about uh, the so called science. Everything, say, every government, say, uh, every government, say, uh, be quiet, uh, the science will win, be quiet, we are moving at the speed of science, okay? And always we, we listen to these words. We move at the at the at the speed of science. We are we are the science, okay? But um, uh, sometimes uh, during this pandemic, when uh, uh, when uh, was questioned the, the companies uh, that uh, prepare the solution for this pandemic, uh, uh, every time uh, they um, uh, uh, they uh, uh, reply uh, to Dave uh, saying that the Dave dossier have, have been approved by regulatory bodies. And when we questioned the regulatory bodies, 
every time they answer that the, the, they uh, they have faith on the uh, dossier of the company. So uh, no one give an exactly uh, answer to, to many questions that all people and all scientists, all researchers have made in this uh, past three years. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have published uh, recently a, a new paper entitled The Importance of Gut Microbiome in the Pathogenesis and Transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this is a letter, but this is a, a, a summary of what we have do, done in the past three years. What we have done is uh, that we have discovered that SARS-CoV-2 and so the coronavirus family not replicates just in the eukaryotic or mammalian cell, but replicated and, uh, and the host, intermediate host, are the bacteria. Uh, we concluded this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, a, a series of proof with uh, an experiment that is very important that I show you in the next slide uh, or in the in the next slides. So we can summarize that uh, uh, during this pandemic, uh, some mistakes have been made. One mistake is maybe the, the most big mistake is on the fate on the fate side. The first mistake is, is uh, for me that I am a, a Christian, okay? From my point of view, uh, someone has offended the creator. Forget that the real science is not human, okay? The second mistake is uh, uh, by the uh, sense of omen. Is SARS-CoV-2 a virus? If yes, where does it replicate? Only in laboratory or eukaryotic cell or also in bacteria? Are the bacteria and the microbiome more numerous of our cell? Yes. And does it seem normal to you that a virus passes through the microbiome layer without bacteria interacting with the virus or producing different substances than unusual? So at the end of our uh, experiment, we have demonstrated that SARS-CoV-2 replicates first in bacteria, that the oral transmission, oral fecal transmission is most important because there is the bacterial involvement, that bacteria produce toxin, that antibiotics or combination of antibiotics can stop both replication, both transmission and toxin production and the clinical picture of patients, especially in the early stage of disease. And we have uh, uh, observed that the intermediate host, there, there isn't a bat or snake or the other animals, but the real intermediate host is bacteria. And we have also demonstrated in one of our uh, paper that the many mutation came from bacteria. So, and below you can read the title of some uh, of some of our uh, uh, paper. Uh, next slide, please. So, this is uh, some images, uh, a microscope, microscope images from bacteria derived from gut microbiome of uh, patients with COVID-19 and immunofluorescence uh, images where we, we can show to everyone that SARS-CoV-2 is inside bacteria, bind to bacteria. So uh, 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 this is the same reason why antibiotic therapies is justified in the individual subject. Next, uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay. So I show everyone that this is the final and conclusion uh, step of our experiment. Uh, many scientists ask us, uh, are you sure of what are you saying? Are you sure what are you show to everyone? And at the end of uh, we have performed what we uh, believe is the most important experiment. The experiment with the use of nitrogen radioisotope in bacterial culture with SARS-CoV-2. And it's finding in the by mass spectrometry in, in the virus or protein after seven days of culture defini that definitely reaffirms the presence of SARS-CoV-2 and proteins of SARS-CoV-2 inside bacteria. Next slide, please. So uh, we have seen in the past uh, uh, lesson of, of Tina, it is a very, very nice lesson. Uh, we have seen uh, how to modify the microbiome is important to resolve the problem. In, this, in, uh, in one of our paper, we have shown a, 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 some experiment and 
we have shown to uh, to the lecture that uh, uh, there is a list of antibiotics that uh, can uh, stop the replication and uh, other antibiotics that stop the toxic aspect of the microbiome. And we have also uh, uh, show to everyone, uh, uh, demonstrated to everyone that uh, bacteria of gut microbiome continue to produce toxin also uh, when SARS-CoV-2 there isn't present in them after the first contact. So it is more a, a, a mechanism of uh, uh, is more, more a, mechan a mechanism that there is a, uh, uh, first of all of a gut microbiome, and uh, uh, maybe is it would be um, uh, give a sense to the low COVID condition. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, the presence of these toxic-like peptides or proteins produced by bacteria uh, turns out to be an increasing pronounced finding. Their presence uh, is also uh, shown in the neuronal cell in vitro and results in synergic effect in the up and down regulation of uh, certain, zen, cert uh, certain genes during the neuronal uh, development. Um, uh, more information you can, uh, everyone can uh, read in the uh, paper entitled The Effect of Spike Protein and Toxin Like Peptide Found in COVID 19 Patients on a Human 3D Neurological Model. And so uh, the combination of spike protein and the toxin like peptides can up or down regulation some uh, uh, genes in, involved in the brain de development. Next slide. And so uh, this is a, a diagram that we have uh, shown in this paper and uh, we have uh, uh, write in this paper and um, uh, uh, the presence of coronavirus and this protein associ associated with toxin produced by bacteria can, uh, could have a modulati modulatory effect on this gene expression. So uh, what to do if uh, a, a pregnancy or uh, a mother, a future mother, uh, was in contact with, or was affected by COVID-19. No fear. We have treated many, many uh, pregnancy women, and we have treated with amoxicillin and clavulanic acid or other antibiotics in the, in the beginning of um, uh, illness. But uh, uh, we show you in the next paper, uh, and so that are in preparation. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is uh, the question, the most important question now is, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the only virus that replicates in bacteria or also other RNA virus uh, replicate as well in bacteria? Uh, Professor Luc Montagnier has said in the past years that also HIV replicated in, or was, uh, there is a, a cofactor of uh, in each virus of HIV with mycoplasma bacteria. So the problem is just this. For more than uh, 70 years in medicine, the science of men, the one that runs so fast, has forgotten to do the control between virus, viruses and bacteria. Men's science stopped in the, in the 1915 uh, years, uh, years. In the lower uh, left images, you can, uh, on the uh, left side, you can see the first time, for the first time, that we, we have prepared the manuscript that we have submitted, and now it is on the under review. Uh, the first time there is the mass spectrometry data of the finding, always with the experiment of nitrogen isotope, with the polio of the poliovirus uh, proteins inside a bacteria culture. Uh, derived, de derived from uh, the microbiome of the polio patients. So also poliovirus, we can uh, say to everyone that also poliovirus replicate in bacteria and then it has a host intermediate bacteria. So in the past, uh, in the left, in the right side, you can uh, sh you can uh, uh, see a, a, a table of Dr. Sabi in uh, one of his uh, uh, paper. Uh, uh, he, he demonstrated that the immunized with SARP injection vaccine uh, transmitted poliovirus as well in their feces. 
while his vaccine, uh, like the natural healed, did not. Why? His vaccine was an activated virus with favorable strain. So, uh, so his oral vaccine simulated an infection, but in more attenuated way. So the vaccine of Sabin Sab anticipated the infection and in a, in a, a certain sense, sense accelerated the epidemi epidemic of poliovirus. But the reason, maybe, is just this. The reason is that also poliovirus can bind in bacteria. So the, the, our immunity is important, but the, the first real immunity is the resistance of bacteria to the virus, to RNA. Next slide, please. So in, uh, in conclusion, uh, never forget to check bacteria first for every other virus. It should be the first real postulated and it should be applied the first of cock postulated. For the next pandemic, we are we are listed that, that maybe in the future we have we we will have live many other pandemics. For the next pandemic, never fear again. Ne the newer pathogen is more than we build microbiome and bacteria involvement. Every time a new bacteria, uh, a new virus will be present on our planet, it must, it, it, we must always pass through microbiome. Next slide. Thank you for everyone. I have concluded my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Carlo. This is, this is a big topic here. And I, if you don't mind, Joachim, I want to ask the first question because I needed to get some clarity about the point with regards to the polio virus. So yes. if I'm assuming that this is not a normal characteristic of an RNA virus to infect bacteria and produce toxins, is that about correct? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Within that framework, is this an example? Because we heard yesterday the very strong presentation from Charles Rixey about the fact that the lab origin seems to be very high possibility with regards to SARS-CoV-2. Is this an example of using, because if you are giving someone arsenic, you don't give them an arsenic tablet, you put it in their tea and then it has its effect by them doing what they normally do. Is this an example of hijacking bacteria to make people sick? Yes. So, uh, 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 Philip, uh, from our point of view, it is not important if a virus derived from a lab or from a natural uh, production. What is important for us is if there is the involvement of bacteria. Uh, uh, after studying the SARS-CoV-2, we have uh, understand that uh, uh, more a virus has a given function, more uh, will be the binding to bacteria. You must consider bacteria as the first layer of our defense. Every time. Uh, Montagnier, ma also, also Professor Zayak, no one know him. Professor Zayak is the one who publicated the, the sequences of HIV in the bacteria of the uh, uh, oral, oral bacteria of the children of Kenya. Okay? Okay. So he, he discovered the sequence of HIV in the bacteria. And he published two or three papers about this uh, uh, topic, but no one gave him importance. So the, 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 the aspect, the, the public health aspect that we must consider, are we sure that the other RNA virus don't bind to bacteria? And the bacteria, what is the, the, uh, what is the real, uh, uh, the real, um, um, the real uh, thinking of of the microbiome is uh, to defend us, or, or and maybe to engineerize 
the virus, every virus, uh, until it became uh, eubiotic or symbiotic with us? If yes, this, this can make sense. The toxin production, we are also, we also are studying the other aspect in poliovirus. We have seen, I anticipated you uh, in, this, uh, in this moment, that we have also seen the same toxin that we found in SARS-CoV-2 patients in the gut microbiome of poliomyelitic patients. Okay? And data are in preparation. And maybe this is one reason, one reason uh, of the some problem with uh, Sabin vaccine, because all of us know that Sabin vaccine has given some problem like uh, uh, Guillain Barre syndrome in uh, after uh, after the assumption of our vaccine. Okay, all of us know that there are some of these problems, but we are studying that there, is, there are some gut microbiome that produce a high level of toxin and other gut microbiome that don't produce a high level of, of toxin. And so uh, maybe this can make a sense if we restudy the gut microbiome from another point of view, from a point of view of bacteriophages, because there are many papers in the past years that uh, uh, that establishes that there is a, a sort of a competition of the virus, and when a new virus would replicate in bacteria, the bacteriophages just present became a start new production. So it is very uh, many complex mechanisms that there are in the in the world of microbiome. Okay, so I hope that I answer uh, I give a, an answer to your question. Yes, thank you. Joe, should we go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, I would have again, uh, thank you, Carlo. I would have like a million questions, but uh, let me see which one might be the most important for today. Okay, the Streptococcus A uh, infection, especially in children, going around now at unprecedented levels, very high infection rate of Strep A. Uh, can this be a cause caused by the bacteriophage uh, like an onslaught to the biome? Uh, okay, uh, I think that the presentation of, of Tina, the, the first presentation, is uh, is very is very uh, bind to my presentation. is is very uh, there is a leap from my presentation uh, and, and her presentation, because uh, we have uh, uh, observed in one of our paper that uh, there is uh, an increase of uh, uh, bad bacteria and a decrease of good bacteria after SARS-CoV-2 infection, but also many, many other research after poliovirus infection or after uh, HIV infection, okay? So everyone has maybe hemophilus influenza, okay? Everyone has pseudomonas, many of us are, uh, are but there is a level of, of control of uh, the good bacteria and uh, uh, they take this bad bacteria under a, a level, okay? So maybe when SARS-CoV-2 destroy the good bacteria, as we have uh, demonstrated, there is a grow up of streptococcus or other uh, bad bacteria. Okay, Excellent. then we, uh, we might want to look at a great reset of the bi gut biome. <laughs> to be <in> the <laughs> uh, no, we, we are we we stay only at the beginning. We must make many other many other papers on the poliovirus, and later we have show you to everyone. We have many data in the, in our cassette, in our in, in our cassette. We have many data to show everyone, but uh, everything at the just time. Excellent, Thank excellent. You. Thank you very much, Carlo. And we'll be moving straight into our next presentation. But I'm sure many people have questions. And I think uh, many of the clinicians as well have heard your research and have used it. So Thank you very much, Carlo. And we'll go straight into our next presentation with uh, Dr. Beate Jäger. I'll ask you, Beate, first to introduce yourself, and then I'll bring up your slides. Thank you, Philip. My name is Beate Jäger. I'm from Germany. I'm a physician specialized in internal and laboratory medicine for 30 years now. And my playground was to treat sky high risk patients with biochemistry and extracorporeal treatments.
Shall I go ahead? Yes, please, go ahead. So I would like to talk about diagnostic and therapeutic experience in COVID-19. And from Carlo, we heard how clever this virus especially is. And from a physician's point of view, of course, we have to treat sick individuals but not illnesses. This is important for the, for the approach. And this also means to reconsider the individual genetic predisposition, age and gender related preconditions, prior infections, especially chronic fatigue syndromes, Epstein-Barr virus infection, metabolic disorders, autoimmune conditions, but also malignomas or neurologic prior diseases and degenerative and allergic predispositions. But howsoever both long COVID and vaccine acquired COVID are to be considered as systemic diseases and repeated vaccines weaken the immune system and act as an instigator for pre-existing illnesses. That is what we currently observe. In the beginning of the pandemics, we saw first acute COVID, then long COVID, then only vaccine injured. And now we see a mixture of everything. People who had COVID and got vaccinated three times with different vaccines afterwards and got COVID again or vice versa. So under the microscope and in clinical practice, it's not so easy to distinguish. But there are multiple problems affecting, affecting the different organ systems. So what is one of the important common denominators we can observe? If we look at our circulation, the oxygen exchange and the ventilation takes place in the lungs between the bronchioles and the capillaries, and then the oxygen-rich blood of the artery passes the left heart side, goes through the aortic uh, vessel chains, slows down in arteriolas, within to the capillary system and goes back to the right heart where it is recharged with fresh oxygen. Normally, <clears throat> arterial blood shows 95 to 99% oxygenation, venous blood between 60 and 80. But what do we see in COVID? We saw already in the early stages a very low saturation of venous blood being around 20 plus minus 10%, which is remarkable and indicating that what already the pathologist guided us to show that the main problem sticks in the microcirculation and there where it is mostly invisible to daily routine tests. So how to cope with the very bad cases in COVID? My idea was to introduce health apheresis to treat patients with um, very bad conditions. So HEP apheresis stands for heparin mediated extracorporeal LDL fibrinogen precipitation. And to show you one of my first cases, I've been treating a 45 year old violinist a uh, lady from Germany who had first COVID severe and then got a vaccine shot and acquired a severe perimyocarditis. When she came to see us to receive health apheresis treatment, her venous oxygen saturation was only 16%. Her fibrin concentration was massively elevated. Here, the whitish stuff you can see in the big precipitation filter, it's stuck in there. And after the apheresis treatment, oxygen raised to 86%. Fibrinogen was drastically lowered, as were the melting products, the dimers, and as well were the C-reactive protein. 
So this is a typical picture, but this patient needed 14 treatments to re fully recover. And a recent page, paper showed that the circulating spike proteins could be uh, detected in vaccine-induced myocarditis. We see lymphocytic invasion in uh, this pictures very clearly, histopathologically. And so we know again how clever this virus is in attacking our body. Now, how is the health machine working? Um, blood is drawn, the blood cells are separated from the plasma and given back with saline. To the plasma, we add 400,000 units of heparin sulfate and acetate buffer. Then follows a precipitation, where in the precipitation filter, as showed you, the yellowish whitish filter is the LDL cholesterol and the fibrinogen. And in the next step, the excess heparin is adsorbed. That is the place where all the toxins and the cytokines like TNF-alpha are, are adsorbed as well. And to restore the pH, a bicarbonate dialysis with ultrafiltration is done, giving the blood back to the patient. Now, heparin with its, its special structure and is its many negative charges is predisposed and was shown to bind the spike protein as well as the ACE receptor, which is used by the virus to enter the cell. So now what are the potential benefits of health apheresis in COVID-19? First, heparin binds the spike protein. Second, it reduces within two hours the fibrinogen concentration by roughly 60%. And fibrinogen is the most important determinant of plasma viscosity, thereby restoring microcirculation very quickly. Also, other pro coagulant precursors are uh, reduced. And um, we could show that it is capable of dissolving microthrombi, thereby improving myocardial, cerebral, and pulmonary blood flow as well as it is removing cytokines, C-reactive protein, and viral and bacterial toxins of all kinds, possibly also prions. So the extracorporeal approach allows direct access to micro macro circulation, the removal of lipid nanoparticles and lipids uh, in general is useful to disturb viral metabolism and resources. Protective antibodies are not removed. Blood cell function is unaffected and it can be combined with various kinds of drugs. So um, here a bit confused, uh, just the first case series of all the COVID symptoms we observed and ongoing several head apheresis treatments and the follow-up after 12 months sh showed a drastic reduction in symptoms. Um, this can be uh, read in detail in this paper. Um, Important is now the diagnostic side with the detection of microclots and endothelial damage, which comes about with microscopic investigation as inflammatory molecules bind to fibrinogen, forming protein misfolding, and the teoflavin binds to better sheet structures in fibrinogen, which can be made visible under the microscope. As you can see here, some typical pictures where a vaccine injured cannot be distinguished from long COVID patients. Here you see massive strands, you see uh, little microclots. The diameter here is 10 micrometer, 60 fold uh, amplification, and here destroyed cells. Um, uh, here, in a reconstruction by my co-worker Renata, you see here a millimeter strand, more than a millimeter strand in one patient, 
which makes clear that this cannot pass the microcirculation, so the clots are, uh, are stuck there, and the lymph lymphatic um, uh, uh, scavenger mechanism cannot work properly. So the same for platelets, which can be marked as well. Here you can see massive conglomerates of platelet cells in some of the patients. Here is another example of massive platelet activation. This was from a child of 15 years old. And uh, a recent report from the UK studying 48 million adults in England and Wales revealed clearly a massive increase in arterial and thrombotic diseases as uh, by factor two, the rate of infarctions, ischemic strokes, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, but also heart failure and others indirect. So to come to the treatment options we were using, of course, we were like Tina and Shankara yesterday so elegantly showed, we tried to replace vitamins, we try to replace fatty acids. We use medicinals to give patients a basis. And um, when seeing all the clotting over the past three years, we started with antiplatelet treatment first, aspirin, then clopidogrel, and so it was not enough to dissolve the problem. So we added anticoagulants, <clears throat> apixaban with less side effects, davigatran, uh, good in children, and uh, the sharpest weapon being the unfractionated heparin. And of course, we did stomach protection, intestinal protection, giving antibiotics, probiotics, as Carlo already mentioned, to, to uh, support the first line of our defense and treating the AMCAS in antihistamines with various AMCAS uh, mast cell stabilizers, and of course, cardiovascular treatment in case of um, myocarditis with ibuprofen to treat the prods or beta blockers if necessary. And only in the hardcore cases, we added the help apheresis, which improved mo most symptoms. So that is an example treatment before and then after treatment. And um, another example here, massive activation better after treatment. And just to give a, give a little last out view of a little girl, seven years old, being vaccinated after infection, being unable to walk, unable to attend uh, school, having a lot of um, uh, troubles with clopidogrel only for months. She had already a massive improvement in her first week, improvement in mood. And of course, um, she had still some endothelial damage and some, some platelet activation, but she had her life back. So that is our text sheet, a little summary of what's still to be done. I think um, I stole it from Joachim in lack of doing my own one, but I fully agree that the medicinals and other options have to be studied in further details and in controlled controlled study to end this disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Beata. Really, really appreciate that. Um, I, I, if you don't mind again, George, I, I just really wanted to ask uh, Beata a question. This is slightly a lateral question now. I recently did a presentation on the fact that the embalmers were seeing some extremely unusual fibrous clots that it seems that the scientific community has largely ignored. Based on your aphoresis, because you are filtering the blood, is there anything that you have seen there that would support what they have been noticing? Yes, a uh, very important question, Philip. I exactly observed the same. One of the very, some of the very first uh, patient was a physiotherapist lady from Mülheim, Germany, 
and I, we stuck the needles into her veins properly and we had no blood flow at all. So I put the needle out and I had a 12 centimeter long clot in both of her arms. And I saw this uh, repeated times in several patients and that was the reason that I added aspirin and then clopidogrel and then uh, dabigatran and then instead of dabigatran, heparin because there was such a massive overactivation of the clotting system and in parallel a lack in the fibrinolytic ability that, uh, that as the big strand I was showing you, uh, which is millimeters long, so how should this pass the microcirculation? It's unbelievable. And this, uh, this is... Um, of course, only one part of the story, but I think for the ongoing of disease is the lack of, of clearing up the microcirculation, not only via the lymphatic, but also via the venous system is extremely important to, to be dissolved, to get relief to the patients. And of course, um, but we heard yesterday more from, from my coworker Manan, the brain is in regard to his organ weight, the, the organ with most of the microcirculation and the organ which is most sensitive to hypoxia. And so we heard from uh, uh, Stephanie and Carlo all the various invading mechanisms and also the nasal way. So we have to protect the brain as well as we can. And I think the the idea of a nasal spray using melatonin and resveratrol and some other stuff is is essential to protect uh, patients in in the future, and we have to work on this. And of course, we have not fully understood the whole battery of neurodegenerative diseases I have seen. I never saw so many amyotrophic lateral sclerosis cases. I saw this year in my whole life, uh, of course, I'm not a neurologist, uh, but it's a rare disease and it's increasing as well as Parkinson in, in 20 year old people. And exactly what Stephanie pointed out so rightly, I, I could only confirm the athletic sportive patients were prone to get very, very sick. And I saw some of my patients um, going too early into a rehab and there they experienced a stroke because uh, strokes because not only the blood thinners were taken away, but they were forced to 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 train too early. So it's really a crucial, difficult to handle disease. Excellent. Thank you. George, go ahead. Yeah, no chance. I, I would have like, I would need another two hours. We'd be out there now. <laughs> okay, let's maybe find the most important one. You you mentioned to me like some months ago that you were finding uh, under the fluorescent microscope, which seems to be the only way to really look at uh, the thrombotic conditions in long haulers and back syndrome, that you would find uh, endothelial debris in pretty much all blood samples without exception. So that is an alarming sign. And the, the question I have is, wouldn't it be then the wisest decision to really support the uh, detoxification of the spike protein in the first place? Because that seems to be one of the most prevalent factors being stuck in the endothelium, as Arne Burkhardt has shown, uh, that we get that crap out of there as soon as possible. Yes. <clears throat> uh, in the beginning, when we started with microscopy, which was in 2021, we saw much more microclots uh, like Rhesia and others, and we saw very little endothelial damage. Now I see in almost everybody endothelial damage. And this, uh, although the clinic of the patient is clearing up much earlier, you can see persistent endothelial damage in 14 year old girls, which is not to be expect, uh, expected. Of course, you can see in diabetics and in atherosclerotic conditions, you, you can see similar findings, but the degree to which we see it here, this is concerning and therefore we are having a wonderful cooperation with the Max Planck Institute of Physics, who have developed a better method 
to quantify all these alterations because the, this fluorescent microscope needs a lot of manpower and they are costly and, and this will um, generate a lot of new data which can be quantified and are so like this scalable. So I'm very happy to work with uh, the Erlangen group. Excellent. I, I think we have to definitely, I, we have some more questions for you afterwards, Beate. So hopefully, I know you have some other things to do, but if you can even jump in to get back with us again, I think that would be extremely useful. Thank you very much again, uh, Beate. And we'll be moving straight on to our next speaker, who is Hans. Uh, and I'll ask you, Hans, if you can unmute your mic and then to just go straight into an introduction I'm of yourself. Unmute. Yes, you're unmuted. Yes. Introduce yourself and then I'll bring up your slides. Go ahead. Uh, you can bring also my first slide. There is my introduction. Excellent. And the first slide. Yes. So uh, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a biologist, chemist and pharmacologist. Also an official expert for the European pharmaceutical law. And I'm CEO of a company which produces reference substances, mainly focused on herbals, on natural compounds. Also, I'm uh, chief scientific officer of a group. Uh, it's a plant farm meat group, uh, Naturwerk and Compa Farm. We hear uh, a few things afterwards. Also drilling companies because also water is one of uh, a critical point in our life. I'm professor in China, uh, as visiting professor. Uh, I was long time, over 12 years in a German university, also for food technology and food chemistry, as well as pharmaceutical chemistry and pharmaceutical technology. I'm expert for entrepreneurship at the Bavarian Ministry of Economic Affairs. Uh, so I can help to bring new ideas out of the universities uh, to products at the end. And on the last, uh, I'm working with DIN, the Standardization Institute in Germany, uh, as a national expert at the ISO standardization of traditional Asian medicine, traditional herbal medicine, uh, which is uh, standardized under the Technical Committee 249. So, only for introduction. So, next slide, please. Next one, please. Can you give me? Yes. So, I give... Uh, no, no, that was to one bag. Sorry. Yes, this one. Herbal medicine is a much underestimated therapy opportunity, but there are problems. So in Europe, we have a, a millennium old experience and tradition in the use of specific medicinal herbs and their use as phytomedicine. The European countries, primarily the German speaking area, have always maintained their phyto tradition alongside the Western chemically defined modern medicine and did intensive scientific research on it. In same Southeast Asia, such as China, Japan, Korea, and other countries have an equally long phyto tradition. So Asian countries have also maintained plant-based medicine alongside chemically divine modern Western medicine and have conducted intensive scientific research on it in the recent years. So in absolute, in the other side, in USA, legally said the cause for a herb-free, purely chemically defined so-called modern Western medicine in 1912 and has never deviated from it. It's only a, a possible as food supplements. So triggered by the pharmaceutical industry, the US generally rejects all herbal based medicine. So we can go to the next slide, please. 
So in Europe and also Asia, herbal-based pharmaceuticals require marketing authorization or at least a regulatory registration. For this purpose, extensive scientific and experience-based basic data must be presented and will be intensively examined by the authorities analogous to the chemical defined modern Western medicine. So there is no difference between in the quality. So you have the possibility in Europe to make traditional herbal medicinal products. So you get only a regulatory registration. This is only possible if the product has been in use in the country of origin for at least 30 years without any incident or problem. And furthermore, it is required that the product has been in use in the European Union for at least 15 years without any problems in parallel. So it's not so easy to get this simplified way. In normal case, there are approved phytotherapeutics with an European marketing authorization only with complete approval process along to modern Western medicine. And also the production under EU GMP, including the necessary complete batch specific analysis and permanent monitoring by the authorities. So in absolute difference to the food supplement, in food supplements only, one batch is analyzed any year, one batch. And the producer can look for the best one in his production. And this one is analyzed by a uh, foreign laboratory. So, and if you use it as a pharmaceutical, any batch is analyzed and can only be uh, in the market if an expert gives the stamp for it. So go to the next one. Thank you. So in similar, the legal requirements for Asian traditional herbal medicine is one possibility. The traditional experience-based herbal mixtures as tea decoctions made from so-called decoction pieces or as modernized dosage forms a combination of specific granules. This is one. The other one, these are the phytotherapeutics. For modern combinations, which are not non-traditional, uh, not traditional, complete approval from the authorities, like for modern therapeutics are required. So it's very similar also to the European way. The production has to uh, run under national GMP, including the necessary complete batch specific analysis and permanent monitoring by the authorities. So at the end, in the US, natural based food supplements are under FDA supervision in the market field of natural products. In Europe, food supplements are implemented in parallel to functional foods. So we have to differentiate also functional foods, you can say anything about uh, health functions. Food supplements has no possibility for a legal uh, advertisement. It's not possible. So in Asia, also food supplements are fluking the natural product markets. They are crazy about it, but uh, they have to accept it. So we go to the next one. So nature-based products are not food supplements in every case. We should think about it's very different. My main scope of work in my laboratory in Germany is to provide high pure natural substances with full regulatory documentation as officially recognized reference substances by all authorities worldwide and used by pharmaceutical industry. So I isolate from normally uh, with my team from normally the natural matrix, the one needed substance out of the, of the mixture of one or two million components of only one herb in our daily work. So 
And in normal, one herb has such a high amount of natural compounds and only a few ones are necessary for quality control. So, but we work daily with all on the one side, the mixture, on the other side, the pure compounds. So what is the relevant difference between chemically defined pure substances, also of natural origin or not, and real natural herbal extracts? So that's one of the main questions we, uh, we should look about. Uh, we can say the pharmacokinetics and the bioavailability is completely different. The reason for this is the human liver and in its detoxification function. So let's look at this. Next slide, please. Oh, yes. Also, we see on this active substances are usually foreign substances for the human body. So if we treat with this, so pharmacologically, we have to absorb, uh, observe the absorption, the mode of action, but also the degradation and excretion of foreign substances like active principles. So normally, um, Medical doctors also uh, learn in their uh, education the so-called first pass effect. The liver recognized these chemical components as foreign bodies and their detoxification process also begins very quickly because the liver says it's not a natural compound. Let's bring it out. Such a chemical component is only effective in the body if its plasma concentration is always within the therapeutic range. Uh, so thus, it is necessary to permanently maintain an effective concentration against degradation or excretion by repeated doses and high amounts. So at the figure you see if you uh, make normally a therapeutic intervention, you give a capsule or a tablet or anything else. And uh, this takes only a few hours in the human body. And then the concentration goes down to the critical point. And it's necessary to give again and again each time such a dose, such a dose uh, dosage for this active constituent that at the end, over the long time in the intervention, always the concentration is within the therapeutic range. So if we look to the next slide, we see a totally different system. The pharmacology of natural herbal substances in a natural matrix, like in an extract, is absolutely different. Because the concentration of the only one component is not so high. So the liver recognizes most natural substances in lower doses and in their natural matrix as non-critical and reduces the degradation process to a minimum. This makes it possible to build up an effective dose in the body over a period of time and minimizes the risk of side effects. So you see on this uh, figure also that it takes a few days, but afterwards you have a wonderful uh, uh, running system in a therapeutic range. It is con and this is considered to be gentle to the body. So we go to the next one. Uh, yeah, we can uh, go over this. We have uh, time to, uh, to save. Go to the next, please. So what makes plant or, and herbal components so valuable? Independent of biodegradation, it's the so-called matrix effects. 
In addition to the pharmacological aspect, the positive influences on the physical parameters in dosage forms are also very beneficial. Better solubility, better emulsibility, better stability and better shelf life and positive influence on the microbiome and better resorption. You have heard a few minutes ago. Also, synergistic effects are often multiplicative, not only additive. So significant side effects, even with prolonged use, are not shown. Better acceptance also by authorities for industrial manufactured products instead of experimental individual therapies by medical doctors without toxicological validation. So we go to the next, so we show, the, yes. So with this model nine, you have heard a new opportunity for intervention, a synergistic composition of high potent natural based compounds in a natural matrix for high efficient bioavailability and therapeutic approaches. So you can hear more from Joachim, but also the support of a natural function of kidneys and liver are additionally great challenges. But what happens to toxins that cannot be eliminated very easily? These toxins remain in and destroys or enlarges the liver. Later, these compounds are deposited to the fat tissue for a long time storage and with low metabolism. How can we support the flushing of our kidneys for better elimination and what happens within the brain? So I have, uh, we go to the next slide. I have developed a uh, three new products also. It's one product for, uh, produced from, from NatureWork. We talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, it's a unique and it's efficient only from four herbs. So from yarrow, the bitter substances promoting bile secretion and anti-hepatotoxic effects, the artichock normalization of disturbed hepatobiliary function and influencing the lipid metabolism of the human body, tea leaves, with the positive antioxidant and anti-carcinogenic effects. And at the, the best one is milk sizzle, the alteration of hepatocytes so that liver toxins cannot penetrate into the cell interior and stimulate the regenerative capacity of the liver and stimulates the formula, uh, formation of new hepatocytes. So and the next one, in the next slide is for flushing the kidneys. Also, four herbal extracts are used with very uh, well-known herbs. Dandelion, increased diuresis, kidney flushing, also in kidney gravel and among other rheumatic problems. The nettle, increase of maximum urine flow combined with anti-inflammatory effects. Horsetail improved flushing of draining urinary tract in cases of inflammation and golden rot, anti-inflammatory diuretic stoniferous urologic effects to improve renal flushing. So, and the last one in the last slide is for improvement of the brain. So strengthening the body's own regeneration uh, is done by a capsule for happiness. How can this be realized? All physiological reactions of the human body are influenced by neuronal processes. And so I thought about how can I bring these positive effects into the body and it's used by a uh, typical, you know, tryptophan as amino acid and the modification 5-hydroxytryptophan is the natural precursor of serotonin. But in normal cases, uh, this 5-hydroxytryptophan uh, is not available for the brain because it's used in the human body in normal cases. So you need a specific combination to bring it over the barrier into the brain 
and in combination with TABA to strengthen the nerves, additional natural caffeine and taurine, not the chemical, it's only in combination in the natural extract, as well as St. John's word and a few other things like vitamins, selenium, and in this combination, this migrates through the blood brain barrier. At the end, I have no slides for it. We, we have heard about a nasal intervention. Uh, Beati talk about and uh, Joachim talk about. I'm in work for this new product to help also the treatment in the brain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. I, I wanted to ask you a question, and this is again coming from the perspective of um, the clinical side of things. So whilst I understand the benefit of, of herbal medicines, the clinicians will say to you, the difficulty is how do you dose it? Because if you think about most drugs, they'll have two or three doses that will be dependent on the weight of the person and you will select it. You'll think about interactions. All of these things you don't tend to do when you come to food supplements. Is that one of the limitations that they give, this is This is one of the critical points about the discussion of the food supplements. But if you look at the pharmacokinetics, you have uh, seen in this uh, figure two, so uh, it takes one day longer or one day, uh, one day shorter, but at the end, you have the therapeutic value and reached it. And uh, you have not the critical point that in this mixture, the toxic effects are reduced so we have an uh, i would say our liver system with these natural compounds make a balance a wonderful balance not to go over a toxic value but to come over the minimum value for the for the biological or pharmacological work so the people talk a lot of to measure one compound you measure one toxic compound in well, we go over one slice because it's it would be to, uh, takes too much time. So in normal cases, our liver system is the doorkeeper of our body. If you into uh, give an intervention with a chemical substance, the liver says this is not natural. Put it out, and only. If you give so high dosages that it's lower than toxic, but it's toxic for the liver, then the doorkeeper says, okay, there are 200 hooligans, I go back and let it in. But in the next turnover, the blood comes back to the liver, I fish it out. Next turnover, I fish it out. So uh, our liver system put it out and controls the amount of this. So people talk a lot of about dosage, but they don't understand the herbal pharmacokinetics. Excellent. A uh, quick question, George. Go ahead. Yes. Um, first of all, let me make a little comment. I, I wish that every company that uh, works in the, in the supplement industry. Uh, would seek your advice because uh, after we met quite a while ago i had to uh, do a lot of new homework you were overhauling our complete formulation and now we're working on the new nasal spray and i have to really uh, give you a big compliment to your team and your laboratory and especially you thank you on how these compounds work and uh, maybe we are able now to convince many doctors that are very focused because they know their pharmaceutical drugs to also include the uh, the products that uh, come out of the uh, supplement sector or nutraceutical sector because the amount of pathways that we can uh, address at the same time with these compounds they are so multi-talented it's like a broad spectrum uh, a dominance that we can get over these pathways um, and so in addition to all the other interventions that we heard today it really makes sense to get these more into the treatment protocols 
And my question would be like, how do you see the development of the uh, new protocols, like in, in regard to spike detox, working with enzymes, you are an expert on enzymes. Uh, what, what dangers do you see and what potential? Well, we have a lot of potentials and a lot of possibilities to uh, bring it in a short time. I, I think in a short time. We should uh, think about how can we damage the spike proteins. Uh, so we think about these uh, problems over a long time now. Uh, with the one with medicinals, we have the first step. Uh, with the nasal spray, the second step, the degradation, more degradation with enzymes and uh, in combination, the third step. So then let us speak later at the round table, maybe also with Dr. Robin Rose. Uh, we'll be yes. to explain that Thank you so much. Wonderful. And we've got uh, Dr. Robin Rose here with us straight away to go straight into our next presentation. So thank you all very much. We have one more presentation after Dr. Rose with Rachel, Jesse, and then we'll have our round table. We know that it's a long run, but we really appreciate everyone for being here. So uh, Robin, I'll ask you to quickly just do your, your um, overview of yourself and then I'll bring up your slides. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Robin Rose. I work in the United States. I have a functional integrative clinic. I'm double board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. And I practice mostly functional gastro gastroenterology. And um, I just want to thank Philip and Josham uh, for putting this conference together and asking me to speak. I'm honored. And also thank my most brilliant and esteemed colleagues that have been speaking at this conference, uh, that I get to collaborate with them. And they allow me to be a better clinician uh, through their research and uh, develop and apply all these interventions to our patients. Um, so you can bring up the slides now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I just want to, so I'm going to be talking about or focusing in on the clinical applications of the spike detox protocol that many of you um, and many people have been speaking about that we're hoping to find something that can really help um, move the spike out of us. Um, um, I'm going to look at, you know, and I'm going to analyze some keys, key disease pathways and, you know, then that's going to show us the rationale for use of the protocol and the management of long hauler COVID and post-vaccine injury. Um, I just want to start off just by saying one other thing that this, you know, we are going to be experiencing likely the biggest humanitarian crisis of our times. I mean, I have patients just coming in off the street, um, not with long hauler per se, which is a huge bucket in my practice, but just to optimize their health or because they have some gut issues or because they just haven't felt right um, in the past year, year and a half or two years. And I will tell you that biochemically, almost nobody looks okay. Nobody looks okay. So people are going to continue to get sick, become incapacitated and not be able to work, make money, et cetera. And we're going to see many long haulers um, coming our way down the path. And already all of the long haulers uh, at this point um, and post-vax injured patients have spent tens of thousands of dollars on care and treatment. And, you know, there's just so much noise out there. Like, how do you know what to take? How do you know how to take it? When to take it? For how long to take it? Is it safe? Right? So our, my colleagues, our research group globally, we are evolving all the time around this knowledge on a daily basis. And we're fighting so hard to learn on a daily basis every day so that we can help you. So um, you can go to the next slide, Philip. Thanks. So, um, you know, I'm going to really dive into this spike detox protocol. And you see at the bottom this Buyers Club RX that I've um, shown because a group of physicians and scientists have come together to create and support the Buyers Club RX. And the products and supplements that are the safest and most tested on the market, as well as advanced diagnostic testing, are going to be available to patients like yourselves that have struggled for so long and that are starting to struggle at, you know, 25 to 30 percent below what you're normally used to having to lay out of your pockets. 
And if you go to our website, you will be able to understand how we are able to do this, what our mission is, and how we are partnering with doctors and physicians and practitioners around the country to really take care of you. That's that's our mission. So let me deep dive into this and show you because a lot of these things that we're going to talk about are going to be available uh, through this means that I'm talk through these means that I'm talking about. So the persistent spike proteins in the organs are fueling the progression of disease. The ability to degrade spike is impaired, therefore it stays in the organism, you know, whether it's the animal trials you're seeing or us as human beings. And the spike detox is this, is really essential baseline treatment. We all we all know that. And it's essential treatment for all long hauler COVID and post vax injury patients to actually achieve true regression and remission of the disease. This is why we see such an ebb and flow with so many of our patients that they'll feel 80 to 90% better and then they backslide whether they got another vaccination or they were exposed to the virus. Um, next slide, Philip, please. Um, this was a paper um, talking about um, the spike protein and how it accumulates in the skull meninges and brain axis. And as Dr. Manin uh, pointed out so eloquently yesterday, that this is the worst place to harbor uh, the spike protein. It leads to significant neuroinflammation, which then in turn leads to turbo neurodegeneration, which we are all seeing at vast amounts in our practice. I mean, we're diagnosing Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in late teens and 20s and 30s. It's just truly, truly astounding and disturbing. Um, essentially, uh, we have spike, uh, we have persistent spike, obviously, in the neurovasculature. And that's what we're seeing here. Next slide, please. These are fluorescent scans uh, from an animal trial that was done where they injected spike protein into mice. It beautifully illustrates how essentially spike protein goes everywhere. On the left side here, you can see um, accumulation in the brain. And on the right, you can see accumulation in the kidney parenchyma. Next slide, please. Uh, this was one of the first studies done by a German pathologist who actually did prove that the endothelium or the endothelial cells were full of persistent spike, as you can see outlined in that orange uh, brownish staining there. Um, this is what is fueling the microthrombi and endotheliitis that we're seeing, causing vascular leakage and stiffness leading to POTS and a host of other problems. And we understand now that these, and see that these problems are endless, unfortunately. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Fill up, okay. Um, this slide, I'm sorry. Um, this slide is basically showing us, and you know, Stephanie Seneff uh, spoke beautifully about this, how spike protein is shipped around in extracellular vesicles. So essentially we have these um, exosomes carrying spike protein. And we know through all the beautiful research that has been done that they're highly fusogenic. They are spreading and injecting the spike protein into other cells. And once it's delivered to a cell, it will cause the cell to then go into that senescent state. Uh, that Stephanie um, spoke about so eloquently. And Spike just, you know, really wants to protect its own existence in the cell. And that's how, and that's why it blocks autophagy so brilliantly. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this uh, uh, paper was asking the question, do messenger RNA vaccines induce pathological syncytia? And we now know that this is true. Um, exosomes and lipid nanoparticles are both problematic, but the LMPs are even worse because they themselves cause syncytia formation. And at the same time, the LMP will then infuse the mRNA into the cell conglomerates, into these syncytia. So once the syncytia are formed, it is now a conglomerate of senescent cells or zombie cells. And the signaling to the immune system to take them out is completely impaired. So S1 spike and mRNA are hiding in there, and therefore you have these mRNAs that become like spike-producing factories inside the syncytia. Uh, next slide, please. This is showing from left to right, as you can see, um, senescent cells and syncytia uh, being formed and harboring spike proteins and or persistent viruses. 
um, our protocols that we'll be talking about prevent the formation of the cell fusion by spike proteins. And this is important for organ protection, especially during detox. And we now know that syncytia are formed by three, by three things, the spike protein, the lipid nanoparticles, and the virus itself, as you can see in, this, uh, in these uh, micrographs. Next slide, please. Um, so this is um, talking about um, the kidney syncytial formation and, you know, what, what happens once our body mobilizes spike protein, right? And it's intact. What, what, what's it going to do with it? Well, when it hits the kidney, it forms syncytia. And once again, you have these conglomerates containing spike. And, in the, and, um, and what this study did, they were trying to show how quercetin actually could reduce the syncytial size um, and spike uh, expression. Go to the next slide, please. So it will um, help prevent damage to the kidney. And so mobilized spike, right? Fragments of the spike can then cause severe kidney damage. And we know that this has been reported over and over again. And this, um, and this study really highlights eloquently how pure quercetin really can combat this and lower um, the um, injury to the kidney as well as um, spike protein and the formation of the syncytia. Um, what I want to sort of just touch on really fast is when you're talking about quercetin, you have to understand, um, you know, how, how it works and how it's broken down in the gut. So for example, the reason why the medicinals works really nicely is because it has rutin in it. And we're using the medicinals uh, because we know that the quercetin alone will not be enough to really stop um, this from happening. So rutin is basically converted in the gut to pure quercetin, about 60% of it is. And when you, uh, when in comparison to when you take uh, quercetin on its own, like in supplement form, many of uh, the, much of the quercetin is converted in the gut to isoforms, to its isoforms. And you're really left with a minimal amount of, um, of uh, pure quercetin. And that's why that's the rationale behind using it in combination with rutin in the, um, with its high bioavailability in the medicinals. Next slide, please. So this is, so we're, so that brings us into the first phase of the spike detox. So what we want, what we aim to do here is degrade free spike protein in circulation and the spike that is attached to the receptor, not the membrane actually. And we want to prevent renewed spike protein fusion to the host cells. And we do this by leveraging bromelain, natokinase, augmented NAC, the medicinals nine, and a heparin-like substance. This heparin-like substance is then used as a chelator for the spike protein and the fragments of the spike protein. Next slide, please. Um, this is just showing us how they're, how these molecules work so beautifully together and they're and they have a synergistic effect. This uh, study was illustrating bromelain and acetylcysteine's uh, synergistic effect in a dose dependent manner. Um, and we can see in the graph below the degradation of the spike when they're used together. Next slide, please. This is um, a, a study or an illustration of showing how the uh, makers of the augmented NAC that they can denature the protein, uh, the spike protein within 24 uh, hours, and that's about 99%. Next slide, please. Also, we know many of us are very familiar with natokinase. Uh, this study uh, was illustrating the uh, immunofluorescence analysis of um, de degradation, degradation of the S protein on the cell surface when natokinase was actually added to the culture medium. And uh, we know that in lieu, um, however, this is in lieu of actually not getting to the intracellular spike or the spike buried in the syncytia. And that's why we have to use all of these compounds and molecules together synergistically so we can achieve the goal of moving the spike protein out of the organism. So let's see how we do this. Next slide, please. So this is phase two of the spike protein, which will include overriding the blockages of the spike on autophagy mechanisms. So we're using these specific autophagy inducers, including resveratrol and uh, certain uh, compounds in the medicinals nine. Next slide, please. This is just uh, diagrams outlining mechanisms of autophagy and how some of the molecules um, in medicinals are known promoters of autophagy. Next slide, please. 
Phase three. So this is the most important phase that many of us are missing, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we need to use potent analytics in the right way and in the right order throughout giving the protocol to break up the senescent cells and the syncytium. The Vedicinals 9 has quercetin, rutin, EGCG, licorice, curcumin in it, which are very potent analytics, and we have also added fisetin. Um, bromelain, natokinase, and a heparin-like substance as a chelator or free spike in excess collagen um, are used. Um, uh, they're, I'm sorry, they're used as chelators um, to grab up the free spike and the excess collagen that is liberated in the process. Next, next slide, please. I'm just gonna, this, this is just examples of natural senolytics and how they work, and many of them are being used in our protocol. Next slide, please. This is proof of concept. So our research group is working on studies to show um, what the spike protein does inside of us. And we want to show how it actually is liberated throughout the entire body and organism. So you can see here that we've injected a uh, recombinant fluorescent spike. Um, this was um, intravenous um, through the tail of the mouse. And you can see right 24 hours, a minimal amount, but 72 hours, you can see it has just fusely dispersed throughout the entire body. Next slide, please. Again, proof of concept, we will be sharing a lot of studies that are pig gonna, that will be piggybacking off of these results. But this is showing what, um, what, what the animals look like untreated and both treated at day zero, five, and 11. And you can see by day 11, okay, yes, your body is taking care of some of the, the mouse's body is taking care of some of it, but it's much more exponentially um, gotten rid of with using the S1 spike uh, detox protocol. Um, these are not humanized mice. So we'll be using humanized mice in our future uh, studies with the ACE2 receptors. And we will hopefully be able to show that using this S1 spike protein will be able to address the intracellular um, S1 spike, as well as the syncytium, not just free floating spike or spike float, you know, attached to the uh, cell receptor. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay, I'm going to just quickly for a few minutes dive into some um, case studies of, uh, of the work we've done with patients in our clinic. Um, I'm sure many of you know this already, but there are many biomarkers that are significantly abnormal in our patients, um, including human transforming growth factor, beta-1, D-dimer, A-beta-4240, which is a marker for Alzheimer's disease and beta amyloid production, cardiovascular mm -hmm. biomarkers vascular endothelial growth factor, SARS-CoV-2, uh, nucleocapsid antibodies in the spike IgG, histamine, white blood cells, microthrombi. Um, there's only three doctors in the uh, US right now trained properly to do this testing with a very expensive um, immunofluorescent microscopy. All of our long hauler patients are coming back grade three out of four to four out of four, very disturbing. Um, CRP, ANA, EBV, to name more. Next slide, please. This is examples of some of our microthrombi testing. This is a uh, long hauler COVID patient, uh, 3.5 out of 4. You can bring us to the next slide, which shows some more micrographs of this patient. You can see that there is moderate um, and widespread microthrombi in this patient that's leading um, that's associated rather with the endothelial damage and inflammation that we're seeing in all of these patients. Next slide, please. This is a vax injured patient uh, over two years now. This is what her microthrombi uh, results look like. You can go to the next slide, please. This is also showing widespread significant uh, microthrombi um, results. Next slide, please. Um, this is, um, I just want to quickly show you that we have a male, 66-year-old, uh, long hauler COVID, chronic fatigue, exercise intolerance, dysautonomia, spontaneous tachycardia, heart, horrible brain fog. Next, next slide, please. Um, he had several biomarkers out of range. As you can see, his TGF beta-1 was through the roof. His SARS-CoV-2 antibodies were high. He had a low A beta 4240 ratio, which is ominous. Um, slightly positive ANA, and his EBV titers were high. Next slide, please. We instituted long hauler protocol for eight weeks, including the medicinals, high dose DC, zinc L-carnosine, lumberzyme, which is lumber kinase, melatonin. Arizo Health was a pre, pro, and postbiotic, transverse veritol, easy tech, 
and fisetin, which is a senolytic. Next slide, please. Um, and as you can see at the micrograph, you can see, well, his D-dimer was never really abnormal, but it trended down. His TGF beta-1, which was super elevated, completely normalized. His VEGF, which was at the high end of normal, came down. His SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibodies were trending down. His A-beta 4240 ratio completely normalized. His ANA became negative and his EBV titers went negative as well. Next slide, please. Patient clinically was feeling amazing, no brain fog anymore. His fatigue greatly improved. He was able to focus more. He was able to now exercise again and play basketball, which was one of his loves. He had no more shortness of breath, no more tachycardia. Next slide, please. Female long hauler patient, six years old. Again, dizziness, dysautonomia, exercise intolerance, tachycardia, shortness of breath, chronic fatigue, brain fog, joint pain, and muscle aches. Next slide. Again, same biomarkers, um, significantly abnormal. Uh, D-dimer, TGF beta-1, EBV. Next slide, please. We instituted very similar um, protocol to the previous patient. Next slide, please. Again, we see her D-dimer normalized, her TGF beta-1 normalized, EBV came down. Next slide, please. Brain fog and chronic fatigue significantly improved, joint pain improved slowly exercise again, short shortness of breath improved. These two patients, I just want to quickly note, they were not, we did not have the spike detox protocol, you know, perfected at this point. So these were just patients that we were using with a lot of the known um, compounds that help with long hauler COVID in addition to the medicinals nine. Next slide quickly. Oops, sorry. It's okay. Um, this patient, um, he went through the spike detox protocol and he, you can see his numbers are out of range. He had histamine off the charts, TGF beta one, super high. His SARS-CoV-2 was off the charts, undetectable. His HSCRP was 36 and his EBV was also elevated. And I just want to really quickly give you, this is really, I just think this humanizes things. So he actually, this patient actually, started a long COVID protocol similar to the other two patients, he got 40% better. And when he says that, he was able to only read like a sentence or a page in a book. And then he was able to read a chapter and he was able to start gardening again. And then he got hit with COVID and he continued the protocol, but he didn't get better. So then we switched him and we pivoted to the full spike detox protocol because at that point we had it available and ready to go. And I don't know if Philip wants to play it yet or wants to play it later, but we have his testimonial to explain. We don't have his after labs yet because he's still on week four of the spike detox, but he's pretty much 80 to 90% better at this point. What I'd say, Robin, is that I know time is a factor, but I, I think I'll play the testimonial so that people can hear it, but it will come at the expense of us probably asking any questions. Okay. But yeah, mm -hmm. let, let's, let's hear what your patient had yeah. to say. Okay. Hello there, my name is Steve. I am 55 years old and I have had post-COVID syndrome since I was 52. Uh, I contracted uh, COVID in the fall of 2020 and um, didn't have a horrible case of it, but when everyone else got better, I still had brain fog, um, exercise intolerance, dizziness, uh, trouble breathing, and all of those things forced me to retire from a 20-year career of uh, teaching physiology as a tenured professor. Uh, I could no longer grade papers. I couldn't upload or download files to my computer. Um, so I ended up on um, emergency leave, short-term leave, then unpaid leave, and finally retired on disability. Um, <clears throat> I've seen many different doctors at least 50 appointments with everyone from a general practitioner to a COVID specialist. Well, one day I was at church and the youth and family minister told me his son has post-COVID syndrome and recommended ter Terrain Health and Dr. Rose. So I got in contact with Dr. Rose and she immediately put me on the uh, COVID long haul uh, protocol, which has quite a few things in it. Um, I took this regimen for a week and almost felt normal, had a 40% improvement in cognition, but still had trouble with, um, with uh, um, exercise and dizziness and things like that. 
When I say a 40% improvement, I went from reading one page in a book a day to reading a chapter in a day, which is a very big improvement. Then, all of a sudden, I got COVID again and got sicker and sicker and sicker. And I kept on taking the long haul, uh, COVID long haul protocol uh, for another six weeks. And on week seven, I called Dr. Rose and I just said, uh, this isn't working. I, I need help. And she said, well, we're going to put you on a detox. So she put me on the detox program, which contains uh, bromelain, resveratrol, NAC, and a host of other things. And within two days, um, I felt normal. Felt normal. Now, I'm not going to say I'm 100% cured because I don't know what will come. Um, but uh, I, I'm really shocked after three years. You know, uh, I, I really do feel better. You know, I'm taking it easy, and I'm just uh, grateful uh, to Dr. Rose and Terrain Health for helping me out. Thank you. So, wow. Thank you very much, Robin. I think we've run probably out of time for questions, but I definitely wanted to ask you a question, um, probably when we get to the round table. And I'll, I'll just say this statement. In the context of long COVID, I've observed everything works and nothing works, meaning that it's so important about what you use on each patient because it doesn't seem to follow a pattern where it there is a complete thing that works for absolutely everybody. Okay. But I'll ask you, yeah, I'll ask you about that in a bit. But we'll just get straight into our next presentation um, with Rachel. Uh, are you there now, Rachel? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? I'm hearing you okay. So, um. I'll let you just do your introduction, Rachel, and yes. then we'll go into your presentation. Do you want me to control your screen for you? Yeah, could you do the slides for me, please? Philip? I will. Okay, good. Thank go you. ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. That was absolutely incredible information. And just it's an honor to be here with all these amazing speakers and, you know, all of the information that's been shared over the last uh, couple of days has been absolutely groundbreaking so um yeah as i say it's a pleasure to be here my name is rachel i'm a nutritionist i'm based in the uk um i've been working with long covid patients for three years and i have a special interest in the gut microbiome um but also the oral and the nasal microbiome so um i'm gonna talk very briefly so uh, if you want to share my slides please philip this is a massive area the microbiome when we start thinking about the oral and the nasal and the gut microbiomes it's a great big subject but i'll try and very succinctly and very quickly talk through how i feel that the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has impacted these um, particular areas of the body so I'm going to talk through some of the research, some of my own hypothesis and some of the key concepts, because I still feel that there's some areas that we need to be looking at with regards to particularly the oral and nasal microbiome. And then I'll skim through some of the basic interventions that I've been using in clinical practice to support each area. Now, one, one thing that I'm extremely concerned about um, is that the spike is actively replicating in our biomes and supporting these areas really need to form part of the key intervention protocols moving forward. And the reason I say this is because if we target systemically without kind of understanding the viral and the spike persistence going on within the biomes, we might not be effective with our interventions long term. So can we go to the next slide, please, Philip? This is my disclaimer. So you can skip past this one, actually, Philip. Um, it's just because I'm talking about some interventions. So um, with regards to um, the microbiome itself, what actually is the microbiome? So in simple terms, it's a collection of bacteria, virus, fungal, parasites and other microorganisms that kind of live in and on our body. And the microbiome is involved in many processes and there's three key areas that I want to highlight here today. First, it supports our immune system. Second, it serves as a protective barrier against external pathogens. And third, they produce metabolites that have a significant role to play in physiological processes. 
So at this stage in the game, supporting the microbiomes as a whole is not necessarily going to correct the damages that have been caused over time, although I do feel that that's going to help significantly. Um, but really supporting the microbiomes at this stage is about providing resilience and potentially protection against further reinfection. Next slide, please. So when we are looking at the oral microbiome specifically, I want to highlight that bacteria and associated toxins from the oral cavity has been implicated in the development of systemic inflammation. And this has been well established prior to the pandemic. So we know that oral microbes can trigger inflammatory cascades that lead to widespread inflammation. That's in, that includes neuroinflammation, cardiovascular disease. So why is this happening? How do the metabolites from the oral cavity cross into the systemic circulation? That's next slide, please, Philip. So I've come up with the term leaky oral cavity, rightly or wrongly. Um, and again, this was occurring pre-pandemic, but basically in the presence of gum disease or a disruption generally to the oral microbiome, the tight junctions between the epithelium and also the junction between the gum and the hard surface layer of the tooth will become compromised. And this is when we start to think about using the term leaky oral cavity, as we're seeing then a translocation of some of the, the bacterial and the toxic metabolites transferring through into systemic circulation. And at this stage, we don't really understand if there's a bacteriophage activity going on within the oral microbiome and whether there is this persistent spike replication occurring, you know, long into um, these long haul symptoms. Next slide, please. So looking into some of the research papers um, that I've collected over the last three years, this one is um, this one found that following an exposure to SARS-CoV-2 infection, patient saliva samples exhibited significantly reduced anti-candida efficacy. So this could explain um, some of the reasons behind why people were experiencing things like oral candidiasis, and that was kind of termed in the media as COVID tongue. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this next research highlighted that people experiencing long COVID had disruption to the microbiome within the mouth that led to an increase in specific microbes um, that contribute to inflammation through LPS signaling. Um, and this happened concurrently with a decrease in the presence of pathways that usually help reduce inflammation. Next slide, please. So the key concept that I want to get across here is that a dysbiotic oral cavity potentially leads to a fungal takeover. It can compromise tight junction integrity. It can lead to an increase in inflammation from LPS signaling, um, resulting in a translocation of bacteria, toxins, potentially spike protein. And this in itself is going to have ongoing systemic consequences as I mentioned, neuroinflammation and cardiovascular disease. Next slide, please, thank you. So I use some applied interventions in my clinical practice. I'm not gonna kind of go into great detail in this, but it's just really ensuring that people are having regular dental hygienist checks, ensuring that there's no pathogenic uh, bacteria um, that's problematic in the oral cavity addressing the oral microbiome. So I've been using things like probiotic mouthwashes, mouth rinses. Um, we have a product over here in the UK um, from Toxa Prevent, which is a zeolite toothpaste. And there's a great brand um, in the UK called Truthpaste, um, which is a really reasonable brand. They do probiotic mouthwashes. They do charcoal-based toothpaste, um, which have been, been really helpful. And then there's a product called Dentocyadin, um, which um, is available in the US. Next slide, please. So let's move on to the nasal microbiome. So this research was looking at the nasal microbiome of patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, next slide, please. And the findings indicated that when someone gets infected, the body's inflammatory response to the um, SARS-CoV-2 infection actually led to an increase in the abundance of pathogenic bacteria. And this one highlighted the increase in Pseudomonas, which it normally lives within our body, but it was proliferating and becoming very problematic. And when this guy takes over, you know, it, it can cause some really nasty 
infections. So this might be one of the reasons behind why many people experience secondary bacteria infections, chronic sinus issues and allergies after the initial infection. Next slide, please. So this research was really interesting. Now, the, the research has actually developed structures that mimicked the human, um, human nose, and they were able to accurately simulate how the Omicron and the Delta variant were better at infecting and multiplying in the uh, nasal cavity compared to the original version. So this research also revealed that the virus harms the cell structure within the nasal cavity and also disrupts the tight junction barriers between the cells. Next slide, please. So we come back to these tight junctions again and another concept that I term leaky nasal cavity. Um, so this article talks about how the loss of tight junction integrity in the nasal cavity is exacerbated by allergens, disruption to the, the nasal microbiome, things like dust mites, pollution, and in much the same way as is happening in the oral cavity, a leaky nasal cavity may also contribute to systemic, um, systemic issues. And because the, the nasal cavity is so close to the brain, it becomes a perfect site for the transfer of these metabolites into the central nervous system. And, and Manan has done so much research on, on this and how spike and how um, the virus can kind of get through the nasal cavity into the brain. Um, so it's not been properly established at this point where the spike is replicating or whether there's a bacteriophage activity going on with the nose. If we're finding it in the gut, I suspect it is happening across all microbiomes. Next slide, please. So to further um, highlight the significance of the environmental factors in the nasal microbiome, um, this paper suggests that the nasal bacteria diversity could be influenced by not only health status, but also in the environment. So we're really starting to point to things like air quality, uh, things like molds, mycotoxins, dust, um, and the, the, the ability for those kind of external sources to have an effect on the microbiome in the nasal cavity. Next slide, please. We can skip across the next one. This is just some more research for people to look at. So really the key concept here is that there is emerging evidence that suggests that SARS-CoV-2 may affect nasal microbiome and impair tight junctions provoke inflammatory pathways implicated in things like neurodegeneration. And then we have on top of that, the environmental allergens that could potentially exacerbate these effects by further disrupting the nasal epithelial barrier in integrity. And then we're uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, Philip, we'll move on to some of the applied interventions. So nasal um, rinsing with saline solution tends to be the most um, effective for dealing with things like mold and dust and pollen um, and people who are kind of sensitive in, in the kind of sinus um, area. I generally advise the to not use harsh antiseptics where possible and steroid sprays and, and antimicrobial sprays because they're gonna have an effect on disrupting the nasal microbiome further. I get that some people have to use those, um, use those if, if they're very chronically inflamed in those areas. Um, but most of all, um, it's really about reducing allergen exposure. So thinking about dust mites, pollen, mold, pollution. And I will say around 90% of my patients will, uh, they kind of are coming up with um, mold mycotoxin presence within their, uh, within their test work. Um, so, that, so it's kind of really highlighting that these environmental aspects can have a big um, factor in kind of the exacerbation of symptoms of long COVID. And then of course we have medicinals who are producing, um, I think what's gonna be an amazing nasal uh, spray. So really looking forward to that one coming to market. Next slide, please. So really quickly, the gut microbiome is a huge area. We've heard some information here um, from Carlo. He's done some incredible work with regards to uh, the research into this. Um, and in my own clinical practice and the research that I've been conducting, we are seeing um, some very concerning changes within the gut microbiome. So a decline in the bifidobacteria and the lactobacillus, I think that's across the board, everyone's seeing that. 
Um, I'm actually seeing a decline in the Acomancia morcanophilia species. Now, these guys are really important because they help to degrade the mucus um, that's produced within the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. So if you get a decline in the Acomancia species, that breakdown is going to be inhibited. So that's going to affect the integrity of the, the gut lining and that's going to create excess inflammation. Um, when you take down keystone species such as bacteria, um, bac bifidobacteria and the lactobacillus species, you're going to be leaving the door wide open for the candida and the aspergillus species to kind of infiltrate and take over those spaces. So again, in my testing and clinical practice, you know, these candida, these aspergillus species are becoming very problematic because they can infiltrate right through into mitochondrial function. Then there seems to be a disruption to short chain fatty acid uh, production with an increase in acetate and that doesn't seem to be converting down into butyrate. And of course we have bacteria barge activity which has been described by uh, Carlo Bronya. So next slide please, Philip. The real key concept that I really want to get across here and the, the biggest concern that I have um, within the gut microbiome is that this unfolding interplay of epigenetic um, and immune forces that have been placed on the gut microbiome and likely the oral and the nasal microbiome is providing the perfect environment for the emergence of novel intestinal flora or even a novel intestinal microbiome and we have absolutely no idea the effect that that is going to have on the human host. As we know, the, the interactions from our microbiomes direct a lot of key processes within our body. And at this moment in time, I don't think we know anything about the microbiome now because we, we have got this immense pressure that has been placed upon it over the last few years. Next slide, please. So quickly talking about fecal microbiome transplant. So this has been proposed as a novel way to re-establish the gut microbiome and it has shown some efficacy. Um, so I've had some patients come to me who have had transplant and they have recovered. Um, but the problem with it is it seems to um, not hold um, a, a healthy microbiome for a long period of time. So if someone gets reinfected, then the biome is, is completely disrupted again. So um, although this seems like a really good intervention, that then we need to see more research, we need to understand exactly what's happening in the biome. My suspicion is that if we're not addressing the other microbiome, so in the oral and the nasal cavity, it's likely, um, it's likely a reason why these things don't take hold within the gut microbiome. Next slide, please. Coming on to my last two slides now. So I've put together some applied interventions, a nice little infograph. But basically, the main thing to be avoiding to support the gut microbiome is glyphosate, pesticides. Stephanie has gone into a ton of research about this. Please check that out. If you go keto, you can say goodbye to building the bifidobacterial species because we need carbohydrates and resistant starches to feed the bifidobacteria. At this moment, we don't really have an idea of how probiotic therapy is going to affect the overall clinical picture. Now, the reason I say this is because I'm concerned that in some cases, if there's still this viral persistence or this bacteriophage persistence going on in the gut microbiome, if you introduce probiotics in, you may inadvertently be providing a replication site or further spike replication. So again, it's really a call to action to really do some deep, deep research into the gut microbiome and, and work out exactly what's happening. And also in light of the research that was presented by Christy yesterday, and you know, the bomb that she dropped that, you know, E. coli are capable of killing themselves as a protective mechanism when forced to overexpress uh, protein has far reaching consequences. And if this is happening in other species such as the lactobacillus, such as the bifido, then at this moment, I really don't know how that's going to be fixed. There's, you know, again, it's about coming together, all of the experts around a table and working out how this can be, um, how this can be rectified. So what we can do is we can utilize our common sense. And my mind keeps coming back to these traditional methods, these traditional techniques that have been adopted by naturopaths and, and natural medicine for centuries. 
And I really love an analogy that uh, Dr. Jill Carnahan came up with. Um, and it's basically adopting three main principles to healing. And that is clean air, clean food and clean water. And then my last slide um, is basically, I won't go through it because like, you, can, you can have my slides for download, but this is basically the microbiome roadmap. So it's just explaining some interventions. I've been having some great, um, just to skip to, to, to section four, polyphenol rich diet. This is where medicinals nine comes into its own because it's a polyphenol rich supplement and it may be having some really beneficial effects on kind of building back the biomes. Um, but also I use um, a specific dietary protocol of cycling high carb days with higher fat days, resistant starches and utilizing some intermittent fasting. And that's had some good effect. And then my next slide, if people want to ask me any questions or get in contact, um, you can just connect with me on my website. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Rachel. Um, we've got George in with us as well. Um, you know, you, are you still there, Rachel? I'm frozen in a most hideous way, haven't I? <laughs> well, it, it, it works. So anyway. You have to look at that awful picture of me. <laughs> I think that's something you've touched on there is extremely important, which is to do with the oral microbiome. And the fact that from a clinical point of view, I'd see many patients who I'd expect to have gut problems, not having gut problems, and realizing that quite likely their symptoms were in the upper airway. Yes. Is it just the oral microbiome? But what about the lung microbiome or the sinus microbiome? Is that mm -hmm. still also relevant? A hundred percent. I think there's, um, you, we have to take into um, account that there's quorum sensing going on as well. So this is the communication network that the microbiomes use to kind of um, talk with each other. So, uh, you know, I've only focused on the oral nasal and gut microbiome um, here, but we know that there's a gut lung connection. There's a, an oral nasal pharyngeal lung connection. So they all have this role to play within kind of protecting us, providing us with resilience, resistance against disease, but they also, they're all communicating with each other. So this is when, when Carla Bronya's research came out and he identified that this bacteria barge was occurring within the gut. You know, I was like, oh my goodness, if this is happening, you know, across the board, then, you know, we need to be looking at this, you know, in a, in a holistic, holistic manner. Excellent. And George, I'll let you ask a question and then we'll bring everyone in. Yes, sir. Uh, I would have again. We would need another three hours just with Rachel alone. <laughs> Thank you so much for your work and incredible uh, what you have found out and how good your interventions have played out now in the patients. And uh, one question, maybe, because we were talking about phages and there is a new product out uh, that we are um, evaluating and uh, I kind of have the suspicion we could be able to drive the devil out with Lucifer by using uh, soil derived phage therapies as they've been used in Russia for decades very successfully for especially multi drug resistant uh, bacteria. And the uh, uh, product, the riser product, is also very similar. So, do you think that this makes a chance to, to get this a little bit better under control? Yeah, I think the um, it's probably one of the best toolkits that we've got at the moment because we, you know, from my experience, fecal microbiome transplant seems to be really helpful, but it's not sticking, it's not staying. Um, and I know that that particular Rhizo product, you can use it intranasally, you can use it orally, you can get it into the gut. Um, so I'm really excited to see how that's going to play out in clinical trials as well. And I think that's where we have the advantage because we're going to see how that that's actually working and we can see whether that's actually taking it out from the, the microbiomes as well. Yeah, we get out to start a project now on getting a getting yeah. out a, a, a toothpaste for the oral biome. Yeah, I knew I knew you were going to say that today. <laughs> So so wonderful. I'm ad I'm adding everyone in to um, who is here. I, I think we've even got uh, Shankara here as well. 
uh, and, and Manan from yesterday. I don't know if Carlo is still around. But uh, listen, I, I, I tell you one of the things that has stood out to me. The, the, the more I've listened over the two days, and I mentioned it yesterday, the principle of triage medicine. If this is attacking um, locations like the gut, the brain, the oral nasal cavity, it's quite possible that even within two years, it may not be possible to reverse some of yeah. the damage that has already mm -hmm. occurred. Is that uh, anybody um, want to take that on? You're all muted at the moment. I think it would be above two years, uh, Philip. Uh, we we are still in the infancy stage of understanding the disease. Uh, like six months uh, uh, ago, Joshim mentioned that, Manan, what are your thoughts about nasal microbiome carrying the SARS-CoV-2 across the cribriform plate? I, I, I just like... Uh, was was like mesmerized with that thought. We experimented some uh, stuff in our mice here in uh, Khan University, and we saw that that the bacteria were carrying them in, into the brain through the cribriform plate. As you saw in Carlos' presentation, there are several bacteria in the nasal cavity which act as a bacteriophage for for the SARS-CoV-2. So when my when I get a chance to get my hands on on lab and and stuff and clinical trials that that uh, would be running in different hospitals, we will do that. But two years, uh, I I think like it's it's very humble uh, period. You know, it would be above two years. Okay, to be to be honest and candid. Yeah, I, I think that there have been so many um, approaches. I'd mentioned this to, to Robin, and so I, I probably wanted to ask Robin this question since I didn't get a chance to ask her at the time. I say with regards to long COVID, it appears as though everything works and nothing works. Which What that means is that so many patients, there'll be a cohort of patients who re respond to this, and then there's a cohort who doesn't. How do you differentiate who is most likely to get benefit? You can't. <laughs> Tina's going to you can't. But I think I think something that we that I alluded to in the talk is that we're evolving every day in understanding the virus the S1 spike, the lipid nanoparticles, the mRNA, all of these things that are happening inside of each and every person, right? Um, and that's why so many people, I do believe, have long COVID and don't even realize it, right? Or they have the or they have the effects of these things. That'd and so, I do believe that with the work we're all doing, you can establish certain, you know, sort of common denominator protocols, and of course, pivot and shift when you have to to personalize certain things to each person. I mean, I, as a gut microbiome specialist, you know, and I've worked a lot with Rachel, we've, we've collaborated a lot. We try to establish, you know, really restoring health and balance to the gut microbiome, the oral microbiome, like she talked about in the nasopharyngeal biome, because we find that when we do this, patients also respond much better. Like as Carlo, you know, as he alluded to, too, like most people that are set up for this because they have underlying MCAS or they have um, other underlying disorders, they have a broken gut microbiome. And so they already are deficient in many of the, you know, species that they need to sort of like help them with their adaptive and innate immune, immune responses. And it's not there to begin with. Right. And then now you have the, you add insult to injury with either the vaccine or the virus. And now you're really you know, in major trouble. And I, I do a lot of work with Dr. Hazen, with Sabine Hazen. I send all of my sequencing to her, actually. Like, I feel blessed that I get to do this. Um, and so I send, and I will tell you, the vast majority of patients with long hauler COVID, especially the vax injured, they have completely wiped out their actinobacteria phylum. It is not there anymore. There is no 0% bifidobacteria species. So imagine how immunocompromised these people are. Imagine how they're not able to control their histamine response. They can't make butyrate. They can't, all of these things, right? That like all of everyone on this panel has talked about so eloquently. It, it's like, you gotta restore health and balance quickly, but it's gonna take a long time to do that too, right? 
and especially, you know, taking a food first approach and so on and so forth. It's just, there's so many different factors that have to come into play to get these, these people better. Mm. Yeah. I, 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 I threw out a question some time ago that um, I still maintain from looking at patients is that long COVID or um, post vaccine or even post infection symptoms are predisposed. It's not random. It's not that anybody gets it. There is a predisposition and it comes down to what I think Stephanie is on to with regards to the immune system. If Meaning that if you infected the whole world over and over again, the same people would get the long COVID symptoms. How in the world do we figure that out? Stephanie, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Definitely, yes. I've really linked it to glyphosate and I really think glyphosate is playing a major role in the um, in the really bad response that America has had to the uh, to the virus and also to the vaccine, and it's interesting you talk about bifidobacteria and butyrate, because um, I've actually I have a chapter in my book Toxic Legacy, on glyphosate in the gut, and I show in that chapter it's been shown experimentally glyphosate really disrupts the gut microbiome, preferentially killing bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, allowing the pathogens to overgrow. And in particular, it raises the gut pH, which then disrupts those acid-loving bacteria, and they become deficient, and they are the ones that produce those short-chain fatty acids, um, the um, propionate and, and acetate and butyrate. The butyrate in particular is really important for the healthy uh, lining of the gut. And those are all deficient as a consequence of chronic glyphosate exposure from the food, from the air, from the water. <clears throat> So I think it's really a, a direct hit. And then you have the, the virus also disrupting bif bifidobacteria. I suspect that those people that are getting uh, bad cases of COVID and long COVID, if you had looked at their microbiome before they got COVID, you'd see they already had a deficiency in, in these critical microbes that are keeping the gut healthy. Mm, fascinating point. Any, any other thoughts? Oh, <laughs> I have lots of No, I'm, 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 yeah, no, I'm asking, I'm seeing if anybody else wants to jump in here. <laughs> now, Philip, uh, from, yeah, a, from a dietary perspective, uh, we've noticed that there's a, there's a propensity for uh, affecting different uh, genetics in, in people. Some people are more prone, some people are not. So from, uh, from a treatment perspective, I think allopathy is used to calm the mast cells down. And of course, once we have that, we shift towards the uh, nutraceuticals to keep that going. So no long exposure to treatment. From a dietary perspective, you want to uh, avoid the histamine foods. And of course, uh, certain blood groups uh, determine certain allergens that people must avoid, food allergens. So I use the blood groups, uh, the patient's blood group to determine the foods that they eat or foods to avoid. Uh, from the gut microbiome, we mentioned a product called Rhizo. I use it extensively <laughs> in South Africa. It works very well. It's got a wide diversity of uh, microbac uh, of bacteria in it. I think 42 or 43 different species. Mm -hmm. So from Carlo's work, you've got to use an, anti uh, an antibiotic to clear the gut and restore it with that product. And it can be put into a saline wash to clear your sinuses and restore the nasal bacteria. And it can be nebulized. So a complete uh, restoration of the biome. And I think that's vitally important in solving the problem. And is this an opportunity, as you said, Hans, for the um, the natural medicine to get a comeback? Because at the moment, they have tried all the drugs, they've tried all the vaccines, they're still struggling. Is this the window of opportunity for natural products? I think this is one of the most important things because we can do combinations of different constituents without critical effects. So if we look at the uh, lot of papers, the scientific literature, we see, for me, I see only natural compounds. Uh, but people think they are chemicals. So if you think in this way, we can improve the biological activity over a factor of 10 to, to 100 uh, as factor if we combine it. So uh, this is one of the reasons why medicinal 9 is working so, uh, so, so effective, because it's not only 
the effect of one natural compound in addition with the next one? No, it's a synergistic effect in the combination. And so you can increase it in much, much more higher effects without, without high dosages. You can use low dosages and high effects. So I think natural compounds are the most effective now in, in cancer treatment, also in, in different other uh, things, but uh, we have no interest from the pharmaceutical industry to work with because it's very critical to uh, make patents on it. That's the reason why. But if we can combine it, we have great opportunities. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Tina, I wanted to ask you a clinical question from this. Now, you've been working hard at long COVID and you must have come across the fact that many clinicians don't even accept that it exists as a formal entity. How in the world is the medical fraternity going to be educated about how to help patients, especially when you're talking about doing things outside of the standard pharmaceutical box? That's such a good question, and um, it's um, it's nigh on impossible at the moment. Although I will say, in 2016, when I started treating MCAS patients, um, there was only one urogynecologist in London and uh, an endocrinologist who knew about MCAS that I knew of, and everyone else would just sort of poo poo it. Um, and now things are are changing. Um, and I'm getting more and more um, letters from cardiologists, gastroenterologists, um, and a couple of neurologists that are recognizing MCAS as an entity. And that's a, that's a huge, huge progress. And actually, I think long COVID has sort of put it on the map. Um, so uh, that's one sort of uh, silver lining, if you like. Um, and because patients have made themselves much more educated, and there's been a lot of podcasts and YouTube videos and things talking about it, um, that they're now well informed and go and talk to their doctors about it who may not know, but they're hearing a lot of patients talk about it. So, you know, we, we're sort of doing it from the ground up, uh, I think. And there are one or two colleagues who are really coming on board. Uh, and there are still those that poo poo it completely. And you just think, well, if, you know, especially, if, especially immunologists, it's like, well, if this doesn't explain all these, this inflammation in all these systems, how are you explaining it? And, and I'm sure they don't have an explanation. And, you know, the, the big problem with the, the health system in terms of the body's balance, I use the example of hypertension. If you leave hypertension for five years, even if you use drugs and you reverse it after five years, the damage that has occurred can't be reversed. So in effect, we, we do need to educate the clinic, clinical and the scientific community, but we don't have time. How do we balance that? Mm, that's difficult, isn't it? I think I, I do feel that there is a, a slight change, sea change going on. I, I do, because um, yeah, it's, it's harder for it to be hidden because so many people are struggling with so many symptoms. They are seeing their GPs and their GPs are scratching their heads and perhaps looking for more answers. Um, and you would, you would think that when we write letters saying this patient is much better and this is what we've done, that they would pick up the phone and call us and say, what have you done? That's so interesting. But alas, that's not quite, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure how we do this. I think we just keep plugging away as best we can and papers being produced, articles being produced, patients, you know, um, uh, lobbying their their doctors. That's that's what we can do at the moment. Any different in the U.S., Robin? You know, I I don't know how it is there, Tina, but I I call I left my busy practice. I called it practicing Nick Medicine. You know, I saw thirty patients a day in and out, revolving door, right? And when I went over and I learned and I you know went to the functional medicine integrative. Um, type of way of treating patients because I went through all the schooling and learned all the things I never learned in medical school sort of thing. That's when I really was able to spend time with patients, right? And really dive deep into all of these things that we're talking about. And unfortunately, I don't blame my colleagues, like, like the 95% or more of them here in the US that 
aren't asking these questions and aren't digging into this like we are because they don't have the time and everyone just like is living in their bubble. They want to see their 30 patients, make a modest living, take care of their family, get home, eat dinner and go to bed. Right. And so we're blessed because we're, we are able to do this. Right. And, and so it's going to be the doctors like us that are going to have to really serve the population during this massive, you know, humanitarian crisis that we're seeing and we're going to see, and it's going to unfold, you know, before our eyes, unfortunately. Mm, I agree. May I, ask, may I ask Stephanie a question? Mm, Just very quickly. Um, Stephanie, you know, people are saying that if you take your um, non-organic food, um, vegetables and so on, and you put them in uh, vinegar and a mixture of water, vinegar and um, sodium bicarbonate or baking soda, does that remove the glyphosate from the surface of them? No. No, the glyphosate is embedded in the tissues. You can't mm. wash it off. You can't wash it off, no. Yeah, it's, it's good for the some of the insecticides. I've heard about yeah. doing that. and. As a way to clean, yes. So it's probably useful, but it's not going to help with the glyphosate. I'm going to do the glyphosate. Thank you. I, I want to. I have Beate on the phone. Uh, she is. She has moved to her house, so she can't be on the live stream, but she can hear us. And I wanted to ask her one question, if that is okay with all of you. Yes. Yes. So, Beate, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Can you hear Beate? Is that okay? Yes, we are hearing Beate. Okay, Beate, we, we heard now a lot of, um, let's say, positive uh, case reports and so on. But what, how do you see this general situation right now with the patients you are seeing every day coming in in wheelchairs and being completely destroyed? How do you see the overall picture for the next years to come if the pandemic and the infections keep on going and also the, uh, let's say, the injections are being continued? How do you see the out outlook for the situation? Well, I see it disastrous, to be honest. I'm dealing, of course, with very severe cases, and I'm aware that I'm not seeing the full-blown picture. But the cases I have seen, especially among the children, told me enough. So in our learning curves that this virus is implemented into our genome. The $1 million question is how can we silence this virus and how can we get it out? And with more repeated vaccinations, we see more immunocompromised uh, people, as we heard very well yesterday. And that's what I see in my clinical practice. And therefore, uh, we, we, of course, need a bunch of strategies, but we, of course, need some support to fix this problem. I have not experienced political support so far. I can deal with it. But the problem is that this gain-of-function mutations, which cause immunosenescence, autoimmunity, neuro degenerative diseases, this all has to be stopped as soon as possible. Otherwise, our eco economies will no longer function. And that is what is going on in the moment. And therefore, um, I think there must be a multinational effort to stop this. Yeah, thank you so much, Beate. Yeah. And maybe, can I? Maybe can I, I Go ahead, Robin. Maybe, I can, maybe uh, can I add one one short thing to that? Because that yeah. would now um, we are already worn out after I don't know tens of thousands of hours of research and twenty four seven work for years now, and just by looking at what we saw yesterday with Christy Grace and Charles Rixey and Kevin McKern, again the bar was lifted twice as high as we thought it was before. I mean, we we knew that there was some. Uh, really bad sequences in this spike, but now we have to go one by one by one by one. And it, I, I addressed maybe 10, but there's another 20 uh, really dangerous sequences in that. And we have to understand what they do. So that needs modeling. We need Manon and some other AI experts on, on in silico trials to really look at the, at the structure of these sequences and then look what in the body they are causing and what they are doing. 
and the DNA and RNA mutations and even integrating into our genome, what, uh, what I've been discussing with Stephanie since, I don't know, almost two years now with line one and reverse uh, transcribing into our genome and the complete, uh, let's say, dysregulation of all our epigenetic expression. Now that is really documented well, I can show you all the papers. So all that is still not really solved. We are still maybe at the beginning of the end. Uh, uh, sorry, at the at the end of the beginning and, and not further. So we have to sit down on our on our on our on our on our chairs and start again more research and work harder in the laboratories and we need help. We can't do that all alone. We need really now to call in other people that are much better than us in in these kind of things and give us a hand, please. And Robin, you're going to say something? Uh, yeah, I just what I don't really mean to sound like an alarmist, but I, I will say from a clinical pr perspective, it's extremely alarming to see what we're seeing in just our clinic and patients that don't have long hauler COVID and the biochemical markers, the inflammatory barium markers that are completely abnormal. And I will tell you, we are testing every one of our long hauler COVID patients with the microthrombi testing. And I showed you in the talk that they all have on average like 3.5 out of four to four out of four, right? Grade microthrombi. So I called the clinic, I called Jordan Vaughn's clinic to understand if they had a control group and they do have a control group and the control group even shows two out of four to four out of four. So this is like extremely disturbing and disconcerting and we have a lot of work to do. I, I, I'm gonna bring up something here. There's a point that I've held that, uh, uh, a comment that was made that I think needs to be addressed in a objective scientific way. And somebody's microphone is ringing. But the, the point is, is that a lot of people, we're having this very difficult divide with the vaccine issues and people who are unvaccinated, people who were vaccinated. And then you see comments like this that really skew the bar. How many people that haven't been vaccinated have contracted long COVID? Because the perception is that this is purely vaccine-related injury. Now, that is a part of it. But it's very important to hammer it on the head. This is infection as well that is pretty serious. Don't underestimate the infection. Any thoughts on that? Can I say something there? Um, I, I opened my long COVID clinic in November uh, 2020. And, um, and none of those patients who I saw had, had been vaccinated. Um, and there were thousands of them. Who had all the symptoms uh, of long COVID, but that thing hadn't been introduced yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're quite right. So I think it's a very important point because it we're getting this situation where the unvaccinated cohort has been so upset by what happened in the past two years that they are going down the political route rather than staying focused on the science and the importance of the science. And I'm not sure how that we, we fix that because it, it, it's now all political as well. And, and we just have to get answers. We, it doesn't matter what group you're in, everybody's at risk. Beate, Beate, Beate has a comment on that. One yes. One. Go ahead, Beate. So the first people we saw on the intensive care units dying were just long COVID patients. This was before the vaccination. And I have mm. still, uh, I'm still seeing patients who look like Auschwitz victims who haven't been vaccinated, but um, are terribly sick from long COVID only. The number, of course, is decreasing while the number of vaccinated patients increased so far. And because of um, the high vaccination scales in the, in, in the Western countries, it, is, it becomes more and more difficult, difficult to distinguish. But uh, in, in clinical practice, we most see mixed pictures now. And because of the shedding also, unvaccinated people got vaccinated from the aerosols of other people. So um, 
what we have to find out is the clusters that distinguish why we see in some patients neurodegenerative issues, in others more cardiovascular issues. And of course, this has a predisposition uh, as stated. And, and I can only say that the, the, the vaccine probably in the beginning has also helped something. But after the second vaccine, at my place showed up the people the young people with myocarditis and uncontrollable hypertension and according to stephanie's report we know that um, the vaccine damage is different and more organ spread than the initial long COVID. but of course the virus has mutated but the good news is that our memory cells are still um, still fine uh, to recognize other m mutations and that gives me hope and of course it's an evolutionary process that inflammation and coagulation go alongside and with longer duration autoimmune processes um, hook on this process but um, you know uh, the the most problem is to find a, um, a universal diagnostics and that cannot be the fluorescence microscopy only it must be a quantifiable de device we might achieve from the max planck institute and there are also some other approaches and then we have a, a measure of comparison to uh, and, and we might get some guidelines how to treat people best. And this is what lacks in all the studies. And what I cannot understand and which I feel very humiliating to the patients is uh, this idiotic story of psychosomatic disease. A psychosomatic disease is defined as a psychiatric uh, or psychic origin with somatic consequences but it's vice versa in long covid and vaccine covid it starts in the vessels in the organs and it affects our brain capacities and this should be stated clearly by our our governments that's my personal opinion Thank, Thank you, you Beate. Thank you, Beate. Um, I'll tell you what I think we should do. We've been running now for over three hours, so I'm sure everybody is tired. I'd love if everybody here just gives a, a summary. We've had so many comments in here that are still going, so I appreciate all the people who are still with us and are still talking around us. I appreciate all the wonderful things they're saying. Um, but I'll just ask if everybody can make a final statement, 30 seconds a minute, as to what they think where we are and hopefully where we should go. Since you're at the top, Robin, um, you probably will have to go first. You're muted at the moment. You still, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh my goodness, the pressure. Um, I think that I echo so many things that were said you know, by all of you, brilliant, my brilliant colleagues here. But I, I do believe that we have to work collectively, you know, do the research, get the data together so that people really see that we're serious and that this isn't just like some, you know, hokey pokey stuff that we're throwing at them. I think that we have to be very, very serious in really protecting those that haven't gone on to have long COVID. We have to be very serious in treating those patients that have had long COVID um, because like we just talked about, the virus is not a joke, right? And even though you're not gonna die from it, um, it still has significant neurotropic and oncogenic and you know immunodeficient um, uh, properties. And we, we really have to do a good job of getting the word out about that as well. So really maintaining people on like prophylactic and um, treating the acute COVID and then getting them on maintenance protocols to really protect all of us so that we can live, you know, long, happy, healthy lives. Wonderful. And uh, George? Him? Yes. Uh, thank you. First, all the speakers, also yesterday's speakers and 
I'm so blessed and uh, proud to be together working with you all and contributing hopefully in a way that is beneficial for the patients. And I think that we are, have come a long way, but like I said before, we still have a lot in front of us and I just don't want to sound depressing, but it's going to be a lot of hard work. So let's not become complacent now on the results we have so far. Thank you everybody for participating and contributing. It's marvelous. Thank you. And Hans? I think we should think in two directions. Uh, in, it's my opinion. The first direction would be, uh, we have heard we have uh, new virus types now. We should also think to use natural materials to treat the uh, virus disease. We have done this uh, in 2020 with about 150,000 patients and we have no long COVID afterwards. So if we think at the beginning, it reduces the problems at the end. On the second side, we have to in speed to come forward to treat with new products, new ideas, or from the ideas which come from the scientific work to combine it and to let's make products. Let's treat the people. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. And Tina, your thoughts? Uh, well, I agree with everything that's been said so far. And I think that um, we mustn't forget that we've come a, a long way. Uh, when, you know, two, three years ago, we didn't know any of this. Uh, and these amazing people who have been working uh, so hard, um, all of you, to work out what's going on, how and how best to, to counteract what's happening and to restore health. So we have come an awfully long way. We know we've got a long way to go. We know we need to clear the spike. Um, we are getting nearer and nearer and nearer to that goal. Uh, which is uh, is incredible, and I think we've got to keep putting, you know, the gas to the pedal, really, and and carry on. And we want more teams, as you say, Joachim, to join in and to help with this vital work. I think we also need to help people return to nature and looking for simple things, simplify our lives, reduce the stress, have natural organic foods, don't use chemicals, pesticides, insecticides, etc. Don't use lots and lots of chemicals in your life. Look for good food, freshly um, you know, uh, prepared, hopefully homegrown in, in many cases. Look for clean water. We don't need all loads of things added to our water, fluoride, etc., etc., chloride, etc. You want to have you know, uh, jugs and water filters that get rid of some of that stuff. Um, as I say, reduce our stress, increase our exercise, get outside in the fresh air. Um, grounding is important. Put your feet on the on the ground. Um, let's let's remember that we're actually um, very. The body is is incredible, and it has this incredible ability to heal. Um, and we just need to allow it to do that and encourage it and help it to do that with as na natural um, remedies as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Shankara, you've been on for two days. Thanks, Philip. I'm, I'm proud to be associated with this group of researchers. Uh, I think that uh, we've seen the diversity of effects and all the different uh, modalities of medicine. Uh, we need to collaborate and come together, and I'm sure we'll solve the problem. I must reiterate what uh, Tina has just said. I'm a natural science biologist, and I believe nature will hold, hold all the solutions for us. So yeah, go back to natural living, uh, make sure you avoid all the toxins, grounding is important. I think we just need to understand that we part of a ecosystem, planetary ecosystem. And if we go back to the old ways of living with nature, uh, seasonality in our diets, uh, getting more sunshine, uh, fresh water, uh, we, we, we'll defeat this. So yeah, I'm glad to be part of this and I hope we can take it further, understand further. Thank you. And Manan? Uh, I had a word yesterday, but today I had a different pr uh, group of presenters. I would like to say uh, just uh, splitting the spike protein and getting rid of it is key to long haulers with, with even the uh, reinfection and the long COVID that we are observing with the vaccine injury because the common denominator seems to be and has to has proven to be the spike. So if you cannot cut it and throw it, okay, I say glue it and then try to throw it. So uh, I'm working now on molecules which can 
stick to the spike protein and get it excreted from the body. I will shake hands with all the presenters today, okay? They're great scientists, you know, and, and we'll come out with something very soon as I join Dr. Beate in, in, in Germany to, to glue it and then throw it off from the body. I'll keep you updated, Philip, and through you, all the, our community, uh, how that intranasal thing works when Joshim launches it. So I'm very hopeful, very optimistic, not over optimistic, but practically optimistic that in six, seven months, we are go going to hit something good. And we'll keep you updated on that. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. And Stephanie, you seem to have the last word. We've lost Rachel. Uh, go on. Are you muted at the moment, I think, Stephanie? I'm glad that so many people talked about healthy living because that's been my message for a long time. But I want to bring up the, the fact, uh, the problem with the vaccines. And I really hope that, first of all, all the mandates will be dropped and, the, and that the uh, CDC will advise people not to get the vaccine. I, I would love to see a turnaround that they will admit that every booster shot you get takes your immune system down a track you don't want to go. And it's just going to cause more and more thymic involution, more and more autoimmune disease, resist, you know, lack of resistance to infection, cancer, all these things you don't want. Uh, the vaccines, you know, there's an immediate uh, boost in, in antibodies, and that's not necessarily good because that can lead to autoimmune disease. You get a short-term protection from the disease, and then you get disaster as you go forward. So I need to, I cannot stand the thought of these vaccines on the childhood schedule. This really terrifies me. I think it will cause an accelerated rate of autism among many other things. Thank you very, very much, okay. Stephanie. So, um, yes. I have Beate mm -hmm. still, she wants to say something. Oh yes, uh, let, let Beate say something here. Yeah, go ahead, Georgian. Beate, go ahead. Well, all my speakers before said is true is important let's just end this unnecessary suffering and let's stay brave and i hope god will send us a solution all the best thank you Beate. thank you thank you Beate. thank you all very much for this wonderful uh, conference yes we've gone almost three and a half hours tremendous amount of information it will all still be available i hope this can stay up but i'll share it out as much as i can over time and um i say again um let's keep working there is still a lot of work to be done to try and see if we can help patients and to save lives because the journey has only just started for the long-term effects from the pandemic so i'll I have the outro now so thank you all very much and i uh, thank you listeners for staying with us for this duration of time have a great evening everyone hold on joshem go ahead oh yes i wanted to say this uh, this is of course just the kickoff conference uh, of many to follow because we wanted to first bring out bring out all the speakers and collaborators and then in the next uh, weeks and months there will be bi-weekly um, uh, more concentrated uh, events where we can speak longer because the speakers have to limit themselves to 15 minutes each so we can uh, count on the rest of this year that we will have several more events with uh, smaller groups and more in-depth uh, specific topics excellent thank you very much thank okay you. everyone thank you again bye-bye bye-bye goodbye, bye -bye. goodbye. goodbye. Tschüss, <laughs> du musst noch fahren, ne?